Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this event. My name is Wei Feng, I'm from Little Spring. We are a tech incubator helping startups to uh, raise funds and assist in their space solutions. It's been amazing to work with Apple Exchange and thank you so much for bringing your young buffet and such an exciting event. Uh, so thank you Nicole, thank you Mark, and thank you Roshin. Um, let me introduce Nicole from Apple Exchange. a new type of exchange that we want to offer to you. So when people talk about blockchain, they always say that this is a type of investment. And also cryptocurrency is the best investment you can make. Well, it might be true just a couple months ago, but actually I disagree because first I am a big believer of investment and I am a big believer of blockchain, but I find this statement untrue. Someone who wise with, okay, um, Benjamin Franklin once said that an investment made in college always pays the best interest. That's the type of investment we should trust. And that's why we're here and uh, that's why you are here. So tonight we have invited a few um, top brands and also top experts in this field to share their knowledge and also share their vision with us about blockchain and also where the future stands for this technology. So let's get started by invite um, Dr. Alison Burke and she will tell us all about the government uh, policies on blockchain. Work. 
We have a project on surveillance debate and what's called the crypto wars, where we're looking at the backdoor problem and why there are continual pushes from government to mandate weaker encryption in commercial products. We started this conference series on blockchain protocol analysis and security engineering, um, which runs every January. We're going to start calling it just the Stanford Blockchain Conference, but for now, you can find it on our website at DPACE. Uh, we fund some research into zero knowledge proofs and signature schemes in the security lab that the next people will touch on more. And we look at cryptocurrency policy and regulation. And more specifically, we look at how is cryptocurrency policy being formulated now, and then how should it be formulated? Or what are some of the problems with the way that policymakers and regulators are currently thinking about cryptocurrency? One of the ways that we got into this research area uh, is through Ben Lofsky, who is our visiting scholar from 2015 to 2017. Um, ben is the former superintendent of financial services of New York State. And you may know Ben because he drafted the initial documentation and the initial definition of the bit license. And so the bit license was the first state license that regulated exchanges that wanted to operate uh, using different cryptocurrencies. So the actual bit license debuted in 2015, and since then they've granted about one bit license per year. They granted the first bit license in September 2015 to a company called Circle that was going to be an exchange and is now no longer an exchange. They granted the second license in 2016 to Ripple and the third license in 2017 to Coinbase. So initially what might jump out at you is that that's a very slow process of <coughs> granting. If you're granting one per year, you can probably name within five minutes more cryptocurrency companies and more companies that would want to operate by receiving, storing, or holding cryptocurrency or by operating as an exchange. The licenses don't cover the development of software. They don't cover merchants that accept virtual currencies. You could still operate kind of the way that Overstock.com does. You could operate the way that there's a pizza place in Brooklyn that does that will just accept Bitcoin in exchange for pizza or in exchange for business services. But any company that wanted to operate in some way by exchanging one cryptocurrency for another, or by, by offering wallets, or by offering some type of money transferring service, and wanted to either operate in New York or have customers who lived in New York, had to get a bit license. So some of the initial questions that we talked with Ben about, and one of the reasons why we brought him on as our visiting scholar are, does this kind of licensing system make sense? Are there current licensing structures for example, for someone to be a money transmitting agent or for someone to register as another type of exchange that would make sense to kind of grandfather cryptocurrency exchanges in as, or does it actually make sense that because cryptocurrency is a new form of financial asset that we would need a new type of license for a business that wanted to operate the cryptocurrency exchange? And then if we say that well, we do maybe want some type of license, and maybe this license has to have new properties, then we have to ask, is the state the right level at which licensing should happen, or should we instead grant federal licenses, keeping in mind that there's not really that much of a difference between someone who's transacting as a customer in New York State, someone who's transacting as a customer in California, and that particularly given the broad scope of cryptocurrencies, there's not really a reason why you would want licensing to be different from state to state. So when we were talking about this with Ben, we kind of came down as, yes, it does make sense to have some aspects of licensing required for cryptocurrencies in order to keep in place things like their customer and money laundering laws and <coughs> to make sure that people aren't using these exchanges for criminal purposes or for money laundering because that can attract kind of criminals to your business. And we also kind of came down as no on the second question that the state is not the right level at which licensing should happen, that instead we should look at having a coherent and kind of consistent monetary policy for licensing policy for exchanges across the federal level. So four areas that I want to go over very quickly with you in terms of how cryptocurrencies are treated in the policy and regulatory space are the designation of cryptocurrencies as commodities, securities, and currencies, how cryptocurrencies are treated for taxation, the requirements or lack of requirements to register a new cryptocurrency initial coin offering as a security, and then how some of these regulations address cryptocurrency crime. So the first is that cryptocurrency is treated as property. So property has a legal definition that requires you to be able to possess an object, to be able to control it, to have intent to own it, and to be able to exclude others from possessing it. And this includes intellectual property. There are different categories of property. You can have tangible property, you can have non-tangible property. And currency is kind of a special type of property and you can have tangible currency. You have dollars of coins or bills and you can have intangible property that is also essentially currency. So property is kind of an umbrella and currency is kind of a subset of property. 
One caveat to treating cryptocurrency as property is that there are laws that regulate stolen property. And so we know that there are a lot of, you know, particularly Bitcoins, other cryptocurrencies as well, that have been stolen. There have been exchanges that were hacked. We know of kind of high profile thefts of cryptocurrency. And if we're going to say that cryptocurrency is property, then we have to accept that there are real consequences, not only for stealing those coins, but also for owning those coins or for accepting them later. Um, it's a crime to accept stolen property. Um, and while there's a statute of limitations for prosecuting someone for receiving stolen property, there's basically not a statute of limitations for the return of that property. So if you receive what, is the, what are stolen Bitcoins, you may not necessarily be prosecuted as a criminal for receiving them, but you would, if that is found out, have to return them. And so there are some interesting aspects of that that we'll talk about later in terms of how do I determine which of these coins were stolen, given that Bitcoins are, are fungible. So for the, another aspect that's interesting about treating cryptocurrency as property is that for the purposes of the US bankruptcy code, which also has a very, very broad definition of property, one of the distinction between something that's treated as property and something that's not is when there's a fraudulent transfer claim and an entity that has made the fraudulent transfer is undergoing bankruptcy, the idea of recoverability or of who can then recover that property that was fraudulently transferred depends on at what point in time you're going to be valuing that property. Um, so US Bankruptcy Code treats a lot of different things as property. Um, most of the things that it doesn't treat as property are things like IRAs and retirement accounts. But under the subset of things that are property, things that have been fraudulently transferred, um, you are required to reverse that transfer and return the property that was fraudulently transferred <laughs> or to return a monetary value equivalent to the value of that property at the time of recovery. So you can imagine that if a company fraudulently transfers some Bitcoins a year ago and then is undergoing bankruptcy now, and whoever is the, the owner, kind of the, whoever is taking over control of that exchange is going through bankruptcy wants to recover those fraudulently transferred coins, they would have a very different value if we're assessing the value at the time of transfer a year ago versus if we're assessing the value at the time now of recovery. <coughs> So in some cases, um, there, people have tried to have cryptocurrency be designated as not property under the code of bankruptcy so that they could actually value the property that they were receiving back um, at the time of fraudulent transfer when it would have been valued lower than at the time of recovery. Uh, but the bankruptcy court does consider cryptocurrency to be property. Um, so if you're recovering from a fraudulent transfer, you are recovering the monetary value basically at the time of recovery. So you would be recovering the value of however many Bitcoins are transferred at the, at the value of Bitcoin right now, not at the value when they were properly transferred. So from a community perspective, and when I say from a community perspective, it's not necessarily from any particular coin community, but more from the perspective of someone who thinks that cryptocurrencies have real value and that they should be used and that we should take steps in regulation and in policy to encourage their use and to make it easier to use them. From that perspective, treating cryptocurrency as property encourages the contractual delineation of multi-sig agreements. So it encourages people to be very clear about who owns which cryptocurrency and what they mean when they're entering into a multi-sig agreement to have community control over cryptocurrency. And it also encourages the use of cryptocurrency as a store of value uh, because as opposed to something like intellectual property, um, you are allowed to actually transfer it and you're allowed to retain sole ownership of it um, and kind of use it as a store of value. So in general, it seems good that cryptocurrency would be treated as property. Um, and it's kind of difficult to make the argument that it's not. Some of the things that are treated legally as not being property are a natural resource or metadata. So something that is stored on your phone, maybe that records what time you made certain phone calls. That is data, but it's not your property and it's not necessarily the property of the manufacturer of your phone. It's not necessarily the property of Verizon. It's not considered property is more considered transactional data. It's difficult to argue that cryptocurrency would fall into that category because we do use it as a store of value. Another aspect of the regulation of cryptocurrency is how it's taxed. So it's taxed as, it's taxed as property, but like we said, property is kind of this umbrella term, and it's not taxed as currency. If it were taxed as currency, you may know that you're exempt from being taxed on gains in the transfer of foreign currency up to $200. So if you go to France and you change your dollars into euros and you come back a month later and you still have some euros left over and you change them back into dollars, because there's a relatively low volatility between the dollar and the euro, you probably didn't make more than $200 on that transaction and so you're not 
liable for tax on that conversion. That's not the case for cryptocurrencies because they're not treated as currency. So any time that you transact in cryptocurrency, you are supposed to write that down and supposed to keep a ledger of all of those transactions and supposed to make the conversion to your native currency at the time of that transaction. And then at the end of the year, at tax time, you're supposed to pay you know, the capital gains tax on every single one of those transactions. And whether or not you pay a short-term or long-term capital gains tax depends on how long you've been considered to be holding that cryptocurrency. So you pay a short-term capital gains tax on anything you've held for less than two years, and a long-term tax on anything you've held for more than two years. It's not really defined how that holding should be accounted for by you, for example, whether you should use first in, first out, or last in, first out. If, if, you know, if you've continually transacted in cryptocurrency and then now you're going to use some of that to buy a pizza, it's not really clear whether you're supposed to say that the cryptocurrency you used to buy a pizza was the cryptocurrency that you first bought, so like first in, first out, or whether it's the cryptocurrency that you most recently bought. That can affect the short-term or long-term capital gains tax that you pay. So that's kind of an area where the policy is, is ill-defined. Um, but for the most part, this, re this uh, requirement to pay capital gains tax not only encourages holding, uh, because you pay for a higher tax brackets, you pay a lower rate if you're holding it for longer, but it also complicates record keeping for many small transactions. So it makes it quite a bit harder if you want to use Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee or to buy a pizza every single day. The recording requirements um, and the later reporting requirements for tax on every single one of those purchases that you're responsible for make it a lot more difficult to do that. It makes it a lot more difficult to do many small transactions continually over a period of time. So from that sense, I think it doesn't make sense to treat cryptocurrency in this way, and there have also been bills proposed on the state level to have a similar foreign currency exemption for cryptocurrency transactions, maybe up to $200 or $400, depending on the volatility used um, to exempt people from having to do that kind of day-to-day -day record keeping. Um, designating cryptocurrency as currency from a tax status would have advantages, but Currently, our definition for tax purposes of currency is tied to statehood and tied to the ability of a central bank to regulate monetary policy. So there might need to be kind of a third category if we want to have some of the benefits of treating it as currency, like the foreign currency gains exemption. We may need to define a third category. Something that you may definitely be familiar with is securities registration, or the requirement now that um, I said most ICOs register as securities. So we have this definition of a security, the, the Howey test, that it has a reasonable expectation of profits derived from the managerial efforts of others. And we know that the SEC, when it registers securities or ICOs, requires quite a bit of information. Um, and some of the reason why they require that information is to supposedly protect investors from fraudulent ICOs, which is generally a good thing. There's been a proposal uh, from the Filecoins group of a simple agreement for future tokens, the idea being that something that starts out as a security, like the promise to deliver a token, might be considered a security. And then once the token is actually delivered, the token can then be considered separately by the SEC and may or may not be found to be a commodity. For the most part, all new cryptocurrencies and all ICOs that are being launched now um, are being considered pretty broadly as securities. However, um, Bitcoin and Ethereum are not treated as securities, uh, and that's kind of because they were grandfathered in, in a sense. Um, a lot of the exchanges that were already dealing in Bitcoin and Ethereum were very worried about this security regulation because if an exchange is dealing in an unlicensed security, then they can be in trouble with the SEC or with the CFTC. So we kind of got a grandfathered in decision that, uh, that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not going to be treated as securities, but that pretty much all other cryptocurrencies will be. Um, it's kind of questionable whether or not if Ethereum were being launched now with the same kinds of language being used around its launch, uh, it's kind of questionable whether or not it would be security. Um, it does have kind of a, a governing body uh, that, that more tightly regulates it than Bitcoin. And a lot of the initial announcements of Ethereum use language that are similar to what would now be considered a security. Uh, but because it's kind of been around the longest, it, it doesn't contribute as a security. Uh, Ripple is having some trouble with this security designation right now in that they want XRP to not be considered security. And they make a lot of pretty sound arguments that their business does not depend on the actual token XRP. Um, and that actually two out of their three products don't even use it at all. So they have a pretty good argument as to why it shouldn't be considered a security uh, because it's, it's not kind of the, the core focus of their business. Um, but currently exchanges are 
holding back from listing it in the same category as Bitcoin and Ethereum because it has not been grandfathered in and so is still considered security. So from a community perspective, the, the non-regulation of ICOs and not requiring that ICOs register as securities has led to a lot of backlash, and some of that backlash is kind of overbroad in terms of banning or trading all ICOs or restricting ICO and cryptocurrency ads on all online platforms and basically painting the entire swath or the entire industry with the same brush and saying, well, these are all scams because 80 some percent of ICOs are scams. So, from a community perspective, in terms of wanting more people to use cryptocurrency, I do think it's a good thing that ICOs be registered as securities. Uh, but I think it requires more <laughs> specific language um, and more thinking by the SEC and the CFTC when it comes to something like XRP, when it comes to saying what is the difference really between XRP and between Ethereum when we think about how their respective owners and organizers have launched them um, and how they're used. And then finally, when we think about cryptocurrency crimes, so Exchanges are required to maintain identity records for transactors, and these are the Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering laws. Um, and this is true for U.S. cryptocurrency exchanges, and is being extended in Europe as well to cover hosted wallet providers. For the most part, these rules help enable the taxation of cryptocurrency transactions. Um, they also help prevent against money laundering, and they help kind of give the imprimatur of um, legality to exchanges. They're also important for tracing stolen cryptocurrencies, like we talked about when coins are stolen, we have to have some way of designating which coins were stolen, and particularly when they're going through an exchange, when they're going through a coin tumbler, it can be difficult to determine um, which particular coins should be treated as stolen coins in, in subsequent transactions. So Ross Anderson's group at the University of Cambridge has proposed this kind of first-in, first-out accounting mechanism to give coins that were involved in crimes or coins that were definitely stolen from exchanges that were hacked some kind of black mark. And so, of course, that would make them non-fungible, but that would also solve this problem of how can we treat cryptocurrency as property and also maintain a legal regime where stolen property has to be returned to the original owner. So from the community perspective, um, the perception of criminality associated with not having these types of laws, with not having registration for exchanges, or with not having a way to return stolen property, can keep some investors away, and it invites the kind of overly broad regulation that we see in terms of painting all ICOs as scams, or painting all cryptocurrency as kind of a lawless marketplace where anything that's stolen won't be returned. Um, we know that the, some of the anonymity of cryptocurrencies is tied to their fungibility, uh, but at least pseudonymity would be possible with non-fungibility. So I think that Ross Anderson's proposal is a good one in terms of being able to maintain the legal regime of what to do with stolen coins. Um, similarly, one of the requirements for exchanges is that they maintain a fractional reserve so that they can operate more like a traditional bank or more like a traditional um, money exchanger. And I think that mandating that cryptocurrency exchanges maintain similar fractional reserves of cryptocurrencies is going to end up being good for business and public trust. Um, it could also be used as a guarantee against stolen funds um, if we do adopt some type of accounting mechanism whereby we trace all coins that have been stolen. Um, requiring the exchange to maintain reserves could protect against the idea that some coins are, and are later revealed to have, to have been stolen. So just a couple of things about the future. Um, at a recent G20 summit, there was a lot of discussion on cryptocurrency. Um, the main consensus that was arrived at was that cryptocurrency should be treated as property, and there was discussion about the possibility of treating them as a novel asset class in the future. Uh, I think the way that cryptocurrencies are used in Venezuela is illustrative because they've kind of become an upper bound <laughs> on inflation, where the Venezuelan Bolivar is basically out of control. Um, people don't want to maintain any kind of reserve in the Bolivar because inflation is so high and because there's a lot of threat of uh, government kind of seizure or misuse of the currency. And so a lot of Venezuelans are, whether legally or not, keeping most of their reserve in cryptocurrency so that they can have something that actually is less volatile than their own state-backed currency. And this kind of speaks to the idea that the ability of cryptocurrencies to influence monetary policy uh, increases with transaction volume and is going to be seen initially in sort of failing governments um, like Venezuela, in the sense that the more people use cryptocurrency um, as their primary currency when the state factor and the fiat currency has failed them, the more we can see how um, adopting cryptocurrency on a wide scale and how seeing the way that cryptocurrency operates um, on kind of a nationwide level will affect the monetary policy that governs the exchange and ultimately uh, the volatility of that cryptocurrency.
So that's <coughs> it for me. And I'm happy to take any questions about the cyber initiative. Uh, yeah, so um, there's a lot of obviously nuances to crypto economic models in terms of like medium of exchange or staking. Do you view regulators as taking a nuanced approach to this or are they just going to blanket crypto tokens or are they going to make distinctions for specific characteristics of crypto economic functions of tokens? Yeah, at the moment it does seem like they're taking a blanket view on it um, kind of as, as evidenced by the lack of understanding of the nuance of XRP in the triple. Um, so my hope is that as companies that have their own token make a stronger case for explaining why their token is distinct or why it's more similar to Bitcoin than to an IPO, that they'll have a more nuanced view. Um, certainly the CFTC has indicated that they're going to continue revising their, their position on this. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it seems like they're kind of painting them all with the same brush now, but yeah. I'm hopeful that something like Ripple, which is so large and has so many well-established people working for it, will be able to kind of push policy forward in that sense. Uh, are the cryptocurrencies pegged to the dollar by any chance? No. I mean, Bitcoin and Ethereum are about this. This, this kind of, I mean, we can talk about Tether. Tether is kind of a. <laughs> Tether says that it's pegged to the dollar. That's probably not true. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the, the main kind of more, I guess, respectable cryptocurrency they're not. Yeah. Uh, so, is that for tax purposes? Uh, like, everyone is. Uh, like we will be required to record every transaction, but how is that even possible to verify? I mean, like anonymity is what Bitcoin is all about. Yeah, um, so some of the exchanges do require registration information for people who are using them, and um, some of the exchanges have been subpoenaed by the IRS to provide information on customers whose activity was above a certain threshold. But um, you. You know, <laughs> this is not tax advice, but you could probably get away with not keeping a ledger of all of your individual small cryptocurrency purchases. Um, there's no real way for, at the moment, for the IRS to verify that you're doing that correctly, but in, in the same way that a lot of uh, the way that you fill out your taxes depends on kind of a good faith effort to <laughs> adhere to the rules. Um, they, they put out, this is the way that you should be doing it. and. Uh, if, if the sum probably of your transactions is above a certain amount, they probably will at some point either subpoena the, the business that you have been paying these small amounts to, or the exchange, or the post of your wallet um, to get whatever information they have on you. Yeah. Any comments on the Coinbase versus IRS case? Yeah, so that was, that was one of those where, where the IRS subpoenas some information on, um, on users whose activity was above a certain monetary threshold. Um, I think part of that is because of this rule. Um, you, you're asking how, how the case is going or, or whether it's... Yeah, what's the, the current state of the, the law? Is it, they, they were required to take the 20,000 up. What was the actual case? Yeah, I don't, I don't recall exactly what the limit in dollars was, but they asked for information on all of the Coinbase users um, whose, whose holdings or whose some activity was above a certain monetary threshold. Um, I think mean, initially they asked for information on almost all Coinbase users and Coinbase said that was too broad, but they do, I mean, Coinbase as it operates in, in the U.S. legally does have responsibilities to the IRS to comply with their regulation. Um, so. It, it would be it would be very difficult for Coinbase to say we don't owe you any of the information we have on any of our customers. That would probably lead to them, you know, losing their bit license in New York State and not being able to operate. Also, I should say I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> don't don't take anything I'm saying as legal. Yeah. What is your policy outlook in 2018 and 2019 for governments around the world, um, like for example India? Um, with their cryptocurrency um, exchange, banking, ban, uh, so to speak, like, do you see that effect actually continuing to come out in the next couple of years? Do you think that um, some, some of these regulators, some, some, some people will figure out how to regulate cryptocurrency better than others? Yeah, um, so 
It's looking as though South Korea has been engaging pretty deeply with the correct way uh, to regulate cryptocurrency, that they've kind of gone back and forth and they've gone from saying we're going to ban all cryptocurrency trading to saying no, we want to actually launch our own sole South Korea based cryptocurrency. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in how their policy is going to evolve and also interested in how the EU's policy is going to evolve. Um, so Switzerland, not part of the EU, but they have a very kind of Let's say their view towards cryptocurrency as they do toward many other currencies. Um, Germany also doesn't tax uh, in the same way that, that the US does, that kind of capital gains tax um, on individual cryptocurrency transactions. And Germany doesn't have that. So I, I'm going to be interested too to see how the EU can have one single monetary policy that addresses cryptocurrency um, when different EU member states don't have the com comparable, basically, uh, tax regimes. Um, in terms of countries that are banning cryptocurrencies outright and banning exchanges outright, um, I think that more countries are going to continue to do that, and for the most part, it's countries that are a little bit more, I guess, insecure over their own monetary policy or over their own ability to control cross-border currency flows. So if you think of the three regimes of currency where you have unrestricted trading into and out of other currencies, and you have somewhat restricted trading into and out of other currencies, which is the case for India and for the renminbi. Um, and then you have countries of which I think there's probably just two, uh, Cuba and North Korea, where you're not allowed to, to uh, trade that currency for, for any other currency. Um, so they're kind of very restricted currencies. Um, I think that we're going to see the most policy innovation from, from the first category of currencies where there's unrestricted trading into and out of other currencies. And the currencies are in that, yeah, and the currencies, countries in that second category where they do restrict some of the trading of their currency into and out of other currencies are going to move more toward just banning outright cryptocurrency because it really enables your ability to trade into and out of the host currency. And, and those countries have a particular interest in not letting citizens do that. Oh, which agency? Uh, I've heard, you know, U.S. have like different agencies, like our IRS sees uh, cryptocurrency as a commodity, <coughs> but you know, there's other agencies which see cryptocurrency as a commodity, and then you know, there are various other uh, government agencies that see cryptocurrency differently because of their property. So, do you, do you have any comment on you know, how different laws kind of interfere with? Uh, so for, for the most part, all um, of the U.S. agencies will see it as a property because that's kind of the umbrella to, of um, treating it as a property. And then within that, whether or not they see it as a currency like the IRS um, or as a security like the SEC or the CFTC, um, the way that it's treated as a security is kind of as a, as a special commodity. Um, so kind of similar to the way that, that precious metals are, are seen as something that can be traded like a security. Um, for the most part, the distinction has to do with um, with taxation and with reporting. Um, so whether you're, whether it's treated as a currency or whether it's treated as a security, um, what differs is how you, as a company that wants to launch a token, have to report on it and have to register it. I'm also, I have no idea how much time I have left. Should I take more questions? Or? <laughs> And our next keynote speaker, um, Benedict Bum, is going to introduce more about cryptography to us.
while we, we are having a little bit technical problem, I would like to uh, tell you a little story about our problem, um, our journey to compliance. So our team has been engaged in this uh, blockchain community for more than two years now. And uh, in early 2017, we had, we were doing a project in Texas and we got a call from SEC. And that was like a wake up call to us, like, okay, regulation is coming. So, um, okay, let me tell you more about this story later and let me hand this mic to Benedict. <laughs> okay, that's what you said, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, okay. Okay. okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I will attend to, I feel like for some sort of cryptocurrency conference or workshop, there should be uh, some sort of introduction or uh, um, I want to give a very uh, brief introduction of how these things actually work. What does it mean? What are like some of them are? Let's look under the hood and uh, try to maybe get some sort of understanding of, of how cryptocurrencies and blockchains and technology uh, that powers them works. And I'll be focusing in general on Bitcoin because it's the first cryptocurrency and, and in some ways it's a simpler one. And uh, there are maybe in the questions you can ask about the differences to other cryptocurrencies. But in general, the aspects that I'll explain will apply to all cryptocurrencies. And um, just about me, I'm a PhD student here at Stanford in the Computer Science Department in the Applied Cryptography group. So, um, why is, uh, well, why do we have cryptocurrencies and what is kind of the, the thing is that even before cryptocurrencies exist, there was this allure of digital money and kind of this idea that what if you could send money just like you can send an email around the world without a lot of fees, you know, just um, could we do the thing that email did for mail? Uh, could we do that for uh, money? Can we have e-money? And I will go into a little bit details why we have moved to more digital money, right? There's kind of Venmo and, and all these things, but if you ever try to do an international transaction with traditional money, you will know that these things are very difficult and things like checks and are still very much around. Money is not digital yet in all of its aspects. And so why is digital money difficult? Well, one of the first things that jumps to mind is counterfeiting, right? Uh, what if you have someone can copy paste money and the problem is that with digital things there's uh, kind of you know digital files are very easy to copy right it's very easy to take a file and make a copy of it and then it, there's no way of telling which file was the original one and which one is the new one so this is the problem that many people think of when they think of digital money and what, what makes it difficult. It turns out this is actually the uh, easier problem to solve. And the way that we solve it is just kind of like we solve it in the traditional work with the signatures. Um, so we, uh, what do I mean? Well, so there's this thing that has been around since the late 70s, which is called a digital signature. And uh, when Bob says, you know, he sends one Bitcoin from Bob to Alice, well, how does Alice know whether Bob actually sent this or uh, Bob's evil twin part? And the way that we do that is that there's a signature from Bob, and here I have fancy fonts that unfortunately don't work, but um, the, there's a signature from Bob that says, here's this money is correct. And this uh, signature has the property that if, if, if Bob tries to make this kind of fake signature, and um, so it's supposed to be a fake signature, and it's very easy for, for Alice to tell that a signature is fake. So if I have, uh, more formally, or if, if I have a so-called public key, I can sign something, some statement, with my secret key, and everybody else can verify that it was truly me, the owner of the public key, or the secret key that corresponds to the public key, that authorized this thing, that, that gave this signature and no one else is able to forge a signature. So um, this is used every single day when you open your web browser and go to your bank, you get, when you see this green lock, you get uh, kind of a, a signed statement that this, you're actually talking to your bank or that you're talking to Google, right? There's a signature from Google that tells you you are actually talking to Google and they're providing the content that you're looking at and not someone else. 
So uh, why is uh, digital money then difficult if we have signatures? Well, let's, let's think about you know possible setup. There's some sort of bank that issues five Bitcoin to Alice, and, and it signs it, it gives a signature, and then Alice uh, forwards that money to Bob, and, and also gives a signature that you know those five Bitcoin or whatever were now are now in, in Alice's position. However, what if Alice does the same and uh, gives um, you know this five Bitcoin to Bart? Well, the problem now is that if uh, Bob wants to redeem his money and goes to the bank and says, "I would like the five Bitcoin that you issued to Alice and she sent me," and here are the signatures that all of this would actually happen. Well, the problem is Bart might do the same, right? And then the bank has no idea who actually owns the money. And this problem is called double spending, right? There's, um, and this is actually right. You have this in, in, in uh, you know, it's like if you were able to spend your dollar twice, then uh, and, and there was no uh, kind of, uh, you know, dollar is lucky enough. Uh, you can't spend it twice because you give it away. But that is what is, prevents us in, in, for physical dollars. But with digital money, um, you, you seem to have this problem of double spending. So what is a solution to double spending? Well, a simple solution is uh, a global ledger. So say you have this database in the sky that everybody has access to, okay? And Alice has some money, Bob has some money on it, and Bart does not have some money. And then Alice says, um, sends two Bitcoin from Alice to Bart and, and signs the statement. And then the ledger, you know, the, the two Bitcoin go from Alice to Bart and get, it gets updated. And then, um, well, okay, copy here. And then if, if Bob tries to send money from Bob to Bart, and, and this is, again, supposed to be a fake signature, then uh, it seems like that, uh, you know, it's easy to tell that the signature is fake and this won't go through. So, uh, and now if Alice tries to send more money than she has, so for Bitcoin, then uh, even if she provides a valid signature, then clearly we can see on the global ledger that she does not have enough money to send this. So this transaction is rejected. The interesting thing is though that she had enough money in the beginning. She used to have five Bitcoin. So what this tells us is that the order of transaction really matters, right? This transaction might be valid, right? She could have sent four Bitcoin if this transaction happened first, but uh, because she sent some more money away, uh, th this doesn't happen. So the order of transaction is really the key thing that we need to agree on, and it's the same thing in the double spending case, right? Who did Alice like send the money first to, Bob or Bart? And we really need to have some sort of record of the order of transactions. <laughs> So that is the thing that we need to agree on. So how can we make this ledger happen? I said it's some sort of ledger in the sky. Well, we can have a so-called centralized ledger, and basically, you know, nowadays people are calling this a private blockchain, but basically it's a database, right? And there's a, a there could be a, a, a sort of key manager there that has um, control over the database. And then the, uh, there are two transactions, and, and the, the, the person that manages the database decides which transactions are valid and what the order of the transaction is. So the problem is, of course, that the manager now has a lot of power, right? There's a, there's a, the manager can censor people. He can say, like, okay, this transaction goes in, this transaction doesn't go in. He also, uh, it's, it's a single point of failure. So if that manager somehow is not available, you know, he goes to sleep or something, then you cannot transact on the blockchain. And um, so this is uh, rather difficult, but you know, like potentially a, a, a central bank or something could uh, implement something like this. And um, I would not surprise if, if we see that happen at some point, if there's some sort of you know, centrally controlled blockchain or database by a central bank. But it would place a lot of responsibility and a lot of weight on that one single party. And if it goes down, if they somehow lose their key or whatever, then uh, you know everything breaks down. So what we would really like is a decentralized ledger. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to, uh, I'm going to give you a, a potential implementation of what such a ledger looks like. And, and I'll tell you why this is useful. So this is a blockchain. And why is it a blockchain? Well, basically every transfer so this could be also be 
a couple transfers, but let's just think of it as every transfer is in a separate block, okay? And every block refers to the previous block using something called a hash function. So this hash function is a cryptographic function that takes a large input and outputs a 32-byte string. Okay, so that's a short string. And the interesting thing is that it's difficult or it's, it's impossible to find kind of two inputs that hash to the same output. That's a cryptographically secure uh, hash function. So every block contains this 32-byte hash of the previous block, which kind of um, immutably references the previous block. And so you have this list where, where every block references this previous block, so you can be certain that, you know, even if you have the final block, then uh, you're kind of back-referencing, or it references back to all the things that happened previously. And in every, trans uh, in every block, there's some sort of transfers that happen. So, and then finally, you can have, you know, your final hash, and the nice thing now is, so, so why, why do we do this, uh, all this complicated thing? Well, the final hash of the final block is 32 bytes. The problem with a decentralized system, right, the problem with a decentralized ledger is that we need to agree on everything. We need to agree on, on all the, um, you know, on, on all the things that happen in it. And it turns out that, that uh, agreeing on, on many things is extremely difficult. And especially like in, in computer science, like agreeing on a large amount of data is also very difficult. However, we can kind of compress the state of the blockchain to this final hash. And this final hash is 32 bytes. So as long as we agree on this final hash, that means that we agree on everything that has happened before, right? So we only need to, so um, this is like, I downloaded uh, this is when I made those slides. This was kind of a state, if we agree on this hash, then we agree on the state of the whole blockchain and all the transactions ever happened. So this really simplifies the problem of, of, of agreeing on a global ledger and everybody being in sync of what the global ledger is. And by thus, by extension, being in, in sync on, on what's the, you know, how much money everybody has and what the order of transactions are. So that is the, uh, the blockchain design. But that does not tell you yet how do we agree on these 32 bytes, how do we agree on the state of the blockchain. It just makes the problem simpler. So, um, so basically, this, this, so there are two questions that are kind of you know uh, still open, and one of the questions is like who adds the blocks, right? Who adds new information to the blockchain? And the other question is uh, who issues new money, you know? And these questions were kind of thought of as as as, as orthogonal questions um, uh, previously. But then Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008 came along and said that actually we can so solve both of these problems by combining them and by having everybody compete for adding block and as a reward getting new money. So I'll uh, go into a little bit more detail of how this works. But this was the kind of the genius insight that Satoshi Nakamoto, who uh, published the Bitcoin paper, this is a pseudonym, we don't really know who this person is, but uh, the pseudonym, this, this, this person who published the paper, uh, he or she had this insight that we can combine these problems and have people compete for adding blocks and by that, uh, and get incentivized and by that make the system work. So what happens? So uh, to add a block, a miner has to solve a so-called puzzle. So this is a computational puzzle and it's described here on the left with a hash function. But basically the best way to solve this puzzle is by randomly guessing, you know, by randomly guessing solutions and checking them. And the more often you can guess, the more likely you are to find a solution. But it's a problem that is hard to solve and easy to check. So in some ways, like a Sudoku, right? A Sudoku is easy to, uh, hard to solve, but once you have a solution, it's very easy to check that the solution is correct. But it's kind of a solution where the best way to solve it is just guessing solutions. And the puzzle is configured such that on average, one person in the whole Bitcoin network will find a solution every 10 minutes. And of course, this is not real person people doing this. This is a computational puzzle, so it's computers 
just throwing like uh, computation at it. But the more computing power they have, the more puzzles you can try, the higher your probability uh, of solving it first is, and actually it's proportional. If I have 30% of the, the, the computation power in the network, then I'll have a 30% chance of solving it first. Um, and this really functions like a lottery, right? And, and the more computation power I invest, the more uh, stakes I have in the lottery. And the puzzle changes every single block. So there's no, like if I solve one of the old puzzles, it doesn't help me anymore. I really need to work on the current puzzle to get a current solution and, and, and to do something interested with it. And um, this process is called mining. So uh, why would anybody you know, try to solve this puzzle? Well, solving a puzzle and publishing a block, and in this block you verify new transactions, gives the miner reward. And this reward is newly printed Bitcoin, and also there's some transaction fees. Um, so uh, currently this is, I think, 12 and a half Bitcoin, which is, uh, $100,000, or was $100,000 when I made this slide? It might be like three times as much, or a third of it, I don't know. Uh, um, but the difficulty has, or the, 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 the amount of money that gets issued, in Bitcoin in particular, other cryptocurrencies are different, it has every four years, and what this means is that uh, there's a total, there's a maximum number of Bitcoin. But this monetary policy is really like specific to Bitcoin, and is not an inherent property of, of blockchain. So why would we do that? Um, well, so the reason why we do that is uh, because it prevents something called forking. And what we have is the so-called longest chain rule. So if there are two, um, say there's two, you know, there's Alice the miner and Bob the miner, and they both find a block, okay? So they both, uh, at this roughly the same time, they find a solution to the puzzle and publish, you know, a new transaction. And now there's confusion in the network. Like now, which, what is the state of the blockchain, right? Everybody agreed up to this point, but then on the next point, people don't agree anymore. So what happens is that, uh, you know, everybody mines on the block that they first saw. So there's a miner that mines here, and then, you know, there's a couple other miners that mine on blocks. But in, in this scenario, Alice happened to get lucky. So her miner or she found the next block, and what this means is that uh, everybody is using the longest chain rule. So the uh, miners that previously were mining on Bob's block will now consider the chain that has the most blocks in it. So this is currently Alice's chain, right? It's, it's one block longer than Bob's chain. So they will consider this the, the correct chain and continue adding on that chain. So basically, there was a short time of disagreement, but then the next block kind of resolves that disagreement and then consensus is reached. And consensus is reached through this longest chain rule. Um, so Bob is sad and Alice is happy because she gets a reward, but Bob does not get a reward. You know, they, there was some reward in, in, in this block, you know, some, some newly printed money, but you only get that reward if your block is in the longest chain. Otherwise, you, you, your money is lost. You don't get newly, the newly printed Bitcoin for these $100,000. So even though Bob's solved the, the puzzle, he does not get the $100,000, only Alice gets the $100,000. So why is this important, right? Why could we not you know, be fair, split the money, or something along those lines? Well, it turns out that this longest uh, chain rule prevents something called double spending. So say Alice wants to, uh, is selling a car to, to Bart for 100 Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, Bart is happy, so that's the deal. And then Alice, uh, Bart includes this transaction for 100 Bitcoin for this uh, Lamborghini or whatever in the blockchain, and Alice uh, receives that money, but she's smart, you know, she knows there could be a disagreement here, so she waits, you know, a little bit just to be sure, and then she hands over the keys to the car. Well, now Bart is uh, malicious, right, and he wants to get his money back. So what he's going to do is he's going to try to produce a different blockchain where the, his transaction for the Lamborghini is not included and he still owns the money. So he's trying to rewrite history in some way. So, you know, he creates a new block and, and works for it and it has no Lambo transaction and then, you know, he finds another block. But the thing is that um, the miners or the rest of the network 
follows the honest chain rule. So they still think that this rect chain here is the valid chain. So what they're going to do is they're going to um, extend that chain, and because they have more computation power than BART, so because there's uh, the most of the majority of the network is honest, in all likelihood, they will be the one that exceed uh, or that win in, in, in extending the chain. And Bart can try to like produce a longer chain, but at the end, he's just wasting money and he's just wasting computation uh, power, right? He's he's working really hard to extend this chain, but no one else considers this uh, chain to be valid. So he's just working really, really hard uh, and wasting money, and, and eventually, if he's rational and doesn't want to just burn energy, and burning energy means burning money, right? Like there's a real world cost to solving the puzzle if you need to keep your computers running. Uh, so if he's rational, then he will just give up and, and uh, accept his fate. So this longest chain rule is really designed to prevent this uh, thing. So this is, uh, you know, these two transactions are what we call a double spent. So um, this longest chain rule will prevent it. And uh, Alice is happy because her Lambo money is safe. And so this leads to what I call the Satoshi conjecture. So in the paper, or, or Satoshi kind of says that as long as 51% of the computation power in the network is rational, and what I mean by rational is that they're self-interested, that they want to maximize the money that they can make, um, and uh, they maximize the money that they can make by uh, you know working, following the rules of the network, and by, by, by extending the longest chain, and then basically he says the network will follow the whatever rules we set up. This is not a theorem because uh, it's actually quite difficult to prove and probably not 100% correct. Probably even when you have uh, just 30% of the mining power, you can do some things that are harmful. This gets into a lot of technical details. But still, you know, it holds up in practice, right? We have not seen any sort of deep forks in Bitcoin and people being able to successfully double spend. So um, this is my introduction to, to Bitcoin. I want to talk about something that we've worked on here at Stanford and I've personally worked on. So in, um, in Bitcoin, all the transaction amounts are public. So you can see how much money is being sent uh, and who's paying whom as well, but, but especially you can see uh, you know, how much money goes from A to B. The problem is if you're a business, or say you're an employee of, of a company, and you get your salary in Bitcoin, then everybody can see how much you're making, and, and that's clearly something that people don't want. And, uh, you know, say in the public supply chain, which is what, you know, people propose Bitcoin to be used for that, this means that, uh, you know, Ford is buying tires uh, from uh, Michelin or someone from Goodyear through a blockchain, everybody can see how much they're paying per tire, and these are important business secrets, and uh, this is, uh, they don't want to reveal this. And, uh, and so this, this having these amounts public really makes Bitcoin and, and uh, less usable for, um, for, for businesses and, and private people as well. So the, uh, what we did is, is kind of, you know, there's this concept of confidential transaction. And uh, this up here is a picture of Venmo. Uh, which is so the the idea of confidential transactions is instead of having the amounts in the clear, we kind of encrypt them. We use or we use a so-called cryptographic commitment to hide the amounts. So uh, the amounts are not publicly visible anymore. They're kind of hidden inside this commitment. And uh, this is kind of what you know public uh, or, or popular things like Venmo. There you can also see who's paying who. But you cannot see publicly how much is being paid. So I can see, you know, that my friend, one friend is paying my other friend for rent, but I don't know how much their rent is. So it seems like something that people want even outside of blockchain. So these confidential transactions achieve this. The problem is how do we check that a transaction is valid? How do we check that a person who's sending money actually has enough to, to um, do this transfer? Well, it turns out that there is a cryptographic tool called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. And this is really an amazing thing, you know, that has been around for some time, but uh, it allows you to prove, I can prove you that I know the solution to an equation without giving you any information about this, what the solution is. So for example, I can prove to you that I know the solution to a Sudoku without giving you any sort of information 
what the solution to the Sudoku is. And after the fact, you will be convinced that I know the solution to the Sudoku, and that the Sudoku has a solution, but you have no idea what the solution is. And we can apply the same thing for Bitcoin transactions. So I can convince you that I've had enough money to issue this transaction, and there's no, that there's no inflation that is happening. I can convince you that the transaction is valid, but you will have no idea why the transaction is valid. So um, we developed a, a new sort of uh, zero knowledge proof system that are extremely small and they're a lot smaller than, than the proof system that was previously used, or if it's 10 times uh, smaller, or as in totally it's, it's logarithmic versus linear, um, so it scales a lot better. And the nice thing is that this kind of makes these confidential transactions feasible because it reduces the size of a confidential transaction from, say, 8 kilobytes to something that is around 700 bytes, which is a lot more feasible. And the transaction size really, really matters because, again, you know, the more complex things we try to get agreement on, the more difficult it gets. So there's really, you know, there's a, some sort of scalability debate in, in Bitcoin, or scalability is a huge issue of Bitcoin, because it turns out having to tell everyone in the world about every transaction is actually kind of difficult. So making these transactions small is, is, is a very, uh, is a, one of the things that we're working on, and uh, Bulletproof achieves that while making them also confidential. So uh, this will actually get implemented by Monero, which is the 10th largest cryptocurrency. So I think the goal is within this year that they will actually have, um, uh, they are planning to implement this, which is uh, really cool because, uh, you know, the, or I personally find it cool, but uh, it will reduce their transaction sizes. And, and uh, it's also kind of really amazing how fast research gets implemented into practice here, right? Like this is something that was published this year. And within a year, we'll already be deployed in practice and securing multiple billion dollars, uh, which is currently the value of Monero. So uh, I want to point you, if you want to know more about the research that we're doing at, at uh, Stanford, I want to point you to the site, which is crypto.stanford.eu slash CQRG. That's the cryptocurrency research group, um, which is a part of the, the group that I am, or uh, that's also my private website. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Right there. Uh, is there a way to not only hide the amount of spend, but also the public address of the spend and the user? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So the question was uh, repeated for the uh, video whether you can also hide the send and receiver. So confidential transactions do not do this. Um, there is a cryptocurrency called, but there's basically Monero does this in some sort of other ways. It's in, in some ways, it's an orthogonal problem. Um, and, and Zcash is another cryptocurrency that uh, does this. It turns out that doing this is a lot more difficult in some ways. So you have to use heavier cryptography with, with worse assumptions, kind of, or there's um, yeah, I can talk, get into more details in that offline, but there is ideas of how to do this. Okay, is this maybe one more question? Yeah. yeah. So there's a recent paper by, I think it's from Yale, talking about uh, the anonymizing uh, the, uh, the, the, the linkability of mm -hmm. the Monero. So uh, I think they get recover like 60% or whatever the transaction. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think this is, uh, you know, there's uh, multiple people working on this. The question is there's a paper on, on the anonymizing Monero. And yeah, I think it's a very uh, interesting and good paper. And, and the problem is kind of in Monero, you say, I'm spending one of these K coins. So maybe one of these five coins or one of these 10 coins. And the problem is that the values, if they're too small, then uh, through kind of very smart interception atta uh, attacks and detection analysis, it turns out you can actually often uh, check who is paying whom. And for example, in Zcash, you get the better kind of privacy, which is um, this is like one of all of the coins that have ever existed is the coin that I'm spending. So we really, really don't reveal anything about the coin that you're spending. 
the problem is again this comes at a at a higher kind of cost uh, in terms of the cryptography that has to be used and the assumptions that we have to use this so-called trusted setup but um, yeah so it's a it's a very interesting uh, paper and uh, i think it's definitely a concern yeah thank you I'm sure you have a lot of more questions about blockchain and you wanted to ask um, Benedict. And we do have time after the event to have private talks and meetings. And I will be the next keynote speaker and I would like to introduce you to a new type of economy. So we call it the trustworthy economy powered by blockchain. So when we talk about trust, in my opinion, I think trust is the most important factor in our uh, society. Because without trust, uh, there's no community. We cannot be whole as a community. So we have three types of uh, trust uh, in our society. The first one is the community-based trust. It's more like a trust of self-consciousness. Uh, we wanted to fit in, we wanted to gain trust, and we wanted to be trusted, and we wanted to be part of it. And the second one is the legal system. It's the law that um, in a way forced on us, which is a trust that based on the legal uh, system. The third one, uh, in this, uh, nowadays we do turn our uh, we do turn to technology for more choices. So uh, technology provided trust that is based on mathematics. And uh, maybe law sometimes make, makes mistakes, but math never makes mistakes. So why do, we, why do I want to tr uh, talk about trust and trustworthy, um, trustworthy economy? It's because right now the system that we are living in is, uh, has its uh, problems. Like uh, if I say in banks we trust, I think probably a lot of people will disagree with me. But this is the truth because we do trust our banks no matter how much we do not want to admit it. If you go to a shopping mall and they ask you for your identification, you probably will say why. But if you go to a bank and they ask any information you have about you, you will give it to them because they are managing our life, they are managing our uh, daily business and also our money. So they even created a system to measure if we are trustworthy and that system is ca called the credit system. So uh, everybody is using credit card and uh, based on credit card because banks normally do a very good job and very thorough job uh, on the background to measure if you are trustworthy, how big of a loan that you should be granted. So this is a system we're having. Another problem with this system is because it's centralized. That means that all data is stored in one centralized place. And uh, I can give you an example why this has problems. So the company called Equifax, uh, just a couple months ago, they had a hack situation which resulted in uh, causing 145.5 million American users credit information being stolen probably sold on the black market, causing a lot of problems for society and for individuals. So this is another problem with our centralized uh, society or problems. In this picture, you can see that we have another, we have another solution. On the left side, you see Okay, your left side, you see that this is a centralized situation and the bank is the clearinghouse. What does it do is a very simple math, um, math work, which means that if I wire a thousand bucks to you, then the bank will add 1,000 to your bank account and reduce the 1,000 from my bank. So uh, with this, uh, the bank provided a brand and also authority, 
With this authority, we trust each other and because we trust the bank. So on the right side, you see this is a decentralized system where every note is peer. There's no central authority. So in this network is more spread out and there's no centralized place and the data can be fairly safer. Um, a trustworthy economy, in my opinion, I think we can work on this as four departments. The first one is node distribution, which is basically just distribution in general. And the second one is consensus. I will introduce more uh, heavily on this uh, consensus. And the third one is methodology and also privacy. So who is running the blockchain without the bank being the uh, authority? So how can we how can we trust this system? So who is making decisions? Who is giving their yes or no to a group of people? I give you this one example. This is our Bitcoin community. And this is a map of all those managers in this community. Every dot, every dot in this map represents a node in Bitcoin uh, chain. And right now, we have more, we have 11,077 nodes that is running on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin uh, chain, big chain. And in the United States, we have 2,727 uh, 2, nodes that is running this community. So without the bank saying yes or giving the votes or making a decision, how do we make a decision? When we have that many people and nodes running at the same time, how can we make sure that system works and also in a very efficient way? So here we have a mechanism called consensus. And it is also known as the core mechanism of blockchain. And, uh, we have many mechanisms that um, can be under this consistent, uh, consensus mechanism. And today, I will introduce three um, mechanisms that have been used the mostly. The first one is called POW, and stands for Proof of Work. That means that uh, if you wanted to be the manager of the ledger, meaning that being the miner and to have the right to upload, uh, update this block or this ledger, then you will have to prove or you will have to co uh, complete a certain amount of work. So you can, you can imagine a little village that you wanted to be the bookkeeper and that you will have to prove that you are a hardworking individual. So POW uh, is this kind of mechanism that to prove a certain amount of work, to get the combination to open the lock, to, in, to enter your data into a block and to update this block. And the second one is called POS, stands for Proof of uh, Stake. By this word suggested, a stake, meaning that how much you invest it in, that will give you uh, accordingly how much chance that you can be this manager. So uh, if you invest a lot, like you have a lot of stake at risk with this uh, network, then we can trust that uh, you won't mess around because uh, your interest is at stake. So this is the POS, it's used a lot uh, recently because POW will cause a lot of energy consuming, which is a problem right now. And uh, POS is an alternative to give a better solution. So uh, the third one is called DPOS, a Delicate Proof of Stake. It's like our equity partner in the company, right? So. Individuals in this community, everybody has to has to vote to vote out who is going to be my representative in this community and who is going to get consent, who is to vote, and uh, so this dedicated person is going to be the minor or the manager of the community. So this is the uh, three types of uh, consensus mechanism that used uh, very often in blockchain uh, community these days. So why blockchain? I think that um, our last speaker, um, Mr. 
Benedict, Bonds already explained how it works and why we should trust the blockchain. The first is because it's a distributed ledger, meaning that the data is not stored in one centralized place, but it's all over the world in millions of millions of blocks. So if one uh, block is compromised, it does not affect the uh, system, not at all, because not like uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange or uh, Nasdaq, uh, every, all the information is stored in a centralized place. It's fairly easy to be hacked and also cause a lot of data breach. So decentral, uh, distributed ledger can help with uh, data integrity. And a majority consent is the way that is uh, what we just talk, talked about consensus. Meaning that only when 51% of the majority gave the consent, a change can occur on the network. Otherwise, uh, it will not happen. So with this mechanism, we can make sure that this system is fair. And transparent, any data is out there for everybody to uh, check or review. So in this way, we can make sure that the information on the block is true and, and it's not false information. And uh, the fourth one is the encryption technology. So every, all the information stored in this ledger is encrypted. That means that uh, we can protect people's privacy in a very um, good way. So when we talk about a trustworthy economy, we also talk about a trustworthy person or person's information. Sometimes we do encounter situations that you will have to prove who you are, who you claim to be, and also a lot of identity thefts that they are counting on um, the lack of security of an uh, individual. Maybe you lost your uh, identity information or privacy to uh, someone and one day that you found out that you had another bank transaction that you have no idea and why or when and who is doing that. So uh, with blockchain, we can create a digital identity that will solve the problem of uh, double spending. Um, so blockchain is originally designed to solve this double spending problem that Benedict was just mentioning. Meaning that if I gave you a, a hundred dollar, that means I cannot use this a hundred dollar again. So building a unique digital identity based on blockchain is a, a solution to build your own uh, image on in this uh, digital community. And also, once your digital identity is written on this ledger, we can, we can be sure that this version will be the only version of it. And also, as the owner of this information, you have two keys. The first key is the private key, and the, the, another key is the public key. When you need to verify yourself to, to somebody, then you use your pro, uh, public key, so you don't have to review too much information. Like sometimes you go to a place, they wanted to know who you are, and then you gave them your passport, and you gave them your drive license, but sometimes it's unnecessary to review that much information. And also creating a digital identity on this block, it, we can break down the geographic barriers. So a little bit about our Epiphany Exchange. Uh, we are a compliance ready community based digital asset trading platform and then introducing a new feature called brokerage uh, service. What, what it would do is to help investors like uh, beginners in this uh, um, blockchain community to make better decisions with less risks. And uh, how do we do it is to using digital identity that based on blockchain to build your uh, identity and complete the KYC through this multi uh, factor authentication. And uh, the private key is generated by a third party company. So it will be a great wall between the company, uh, between the platform and the users. And also with the identity data encrypted on this uh, platform, everybody's privacy is protected. And also 
we have our own POS ranking system, meaning that to become a broker, you need to have votes. And more votes you have, more stakes you have, that means that uh, the community will select you to be a better or a good um, broker. And uh, we are developing our own um, network and a multi-tier blockchain system is in the making to integrate different uh, blockchain system so we can build a real decentralized platform. And the centralized exchange and the decentralized exchange both has its uh, pros and cons. Like a centralized exchange, they have higher trading performance and also maybe <coughs> more uh, user friendly, but uh, the, it has some security flaws. And also decentralized exchange with the highest sec security, but the performance also like uh, the um, interface might not as friendly as the centralized platform. But we do think that in blockchain, decentralization is definitely the future and the, the goal. And we already have acquired, uh, we, we already have uh, registered five states a money business service, uh, which I think um, Dr. Allison already introduced to us, FinCEN's uh, FinCEN <coughs> Financial Crime Enforcement Network under the Department of Treasury is uh, issuing this kind of uh, license. And the only way this license you can do a money transmitting um, business in the United States, and every state has different rules. So doing business in the states requires <laughs> to have um, a 50 states of uh, this money service business, uh, money business service permit. And also, we started the uh, ATS registration with SEC. ATS stands for Alternative Trading System. So uh, right now, this is a new rule. And uh, uh, according to SEC, every exchange in the States will have to register with this uh, program. And uh, we are also looking for these four different parties. And first is exchanges. Because Epiphany is not a single exchange, but a, u a union or alliance of a compliance uh, exchange. So if you are running also exchange and want to have business in the US, we're looking for more cooperations with you. And the brokers, we wanted to work with licensed financial institutions like the VCs and uh, fund managers. Also community leaders, uh, we are here in Stanford where it's full of tenants and we wanted to see if anyone wanted to join Epiphany team and to work together. And also the uh, third one is very important. We have uh, this EPN Super Lab and we wanted to find the creative teams and also creative projects so we can build a digital community together. Well, thank you very much, and this is our Telegram group, and uh, if you have any questions, we can talk on Telegram, or we can talk after this event. So our next keynote speaker is from Repos. Uh, Jonathan Ha will introduce us to a new world of sharing economies. Welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Jonathan Ha and I'm the founder and CEO of Red Pulse. So today what I'm going to be speaking on is a new world of sharing economies using token economics. First off, what exactly is a sharing economy? The phrase has been so overused and loose, loosely used that it's almost lost its meaning altogether. But when you think of the term sharing economy, you immediately think of ride-hailing services such as Uber, Lyft, 
and EV in China. We also think of the ability of renting a short-term rental, perhaps someone's house, someone's apartment, really just at the, uh, at the touch of a button on your mobile phone. Very convenient. Yeah. You also think of shared workspaces, so being able to plug into a, a desktop or, or a shared workspace in a very convenient and efficient manner, and also doing so alongside very like-minded people which is, of course, we work, as you can see here. And what's really interesting is that I think by now, um, you've had a sharing economy that's been built around nearly almost any product or service. And pretty interesting here, as an example, is the sharing economy of umbrellas, which uh, didn't seem to work out too well. I, I think they lost all their umbrellas after, after a week. Um, so it doesn't really work out all the time, but that's OK. Uh, people tried. And that's that's uh, that's pretty pretty interesting, nonetheless. So getting to how do we define a sharing economy? So there's six different characteristics that I've identified, and this includes the aspect of being on demand. So having access to some product or service at the moment at which you need it or want it. Second, there being some degree of exchange, exchange of value, and whether that's value that you know, you're being compensated for in, in the form of monetary uh, value or maybe some other product or service, but there's some exchange that takes place. Third, scalability. So oftentimes with these internet-based platforms, having some ability to scale the platform in terms of both users and of course revenues is oftentimes a key component of sharing economies. Fourth, and this is very important, so this is one that I, I certainly do want to highlight a bit more. It's the activation of underutilized assets. Assets that oftentimes are sitting idle and not being fully utilized because they're oftentimes only owned by one person, owned and operated by one person. Oftentimes sharing economies helps to activate and use a lot of these idle assets to a much greater extent. Fifth, a peer-to-peer -peer nature of the platform. So oftentimes having individuals providing some benefit, product or service, to other individuals in a very direct manner, and oftentimes in a very decentralized manner. And finally, a sense of community. So a sense of belonging, also building value within the community, and also following similar ideas and values, really bringing people together. So taking a step back, the idea of sharing economies actually is not new. So if you go back generations, perhaps even thousands of years, back to when people lived in villages, you know, perhaps villages is not more than 50 to 100 people, you already had a very active sense of sharing economy. Because back then, for example, people shared a water well. People shared knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom was was uh, was you know given forth generation to generation, villager to villager, and as another example, these same villagers oftentimes <coughs> shared protection. Whether that protection was physical in terms of barriers and, and walls that were erected in order to to uh, you know protect them from outside um, forces, or that was just put simply um, the stronger people within the village that were willing to protect others that weren't as strong. So in a lot of these ways, the idea of sharing amongst the community is already very active and certainly is not new. Now, as the human population has scaled and we've moved well beyond the idea of living in small villages of 50 to 100 people, and to this, you know, we're, we're now living in really metropolises of you know, over tens of millions of, of people. Uh, and, and oftentimes, you know, you find um, living arrangements where you know you have people that are literally living right next door to each other, but not really under knowing who they are, and that's that's really you know the the sort of age that we live in today, where you know we live in such a, a densely packed environment. Now the issue is, as you scale to a city of this size, a population of this size, people are less and less willing to share with each other. 
share common goods, common services, because you don't really know who these people are. You know, you really don't even know necessarily your next door neighbor. You know, maybe you say hi to them every day, and, you know, and, and you see them getting their mail, and you say hello as well, but you don't really know that person, and you certainly don't feel comfortable in sharing products and services and other goods with them. And a key driver of that is what we call the free rider problem. So what is the free rider problem? So if people cannot be prevented from enjoying a common good, individuals may avoid contributing or paying in the hopes that others will continue to pay. So this free rider problem prevents private organizations, for example, those that cannot levy a broad tax from supplying public goods. And now you guys can probably think of another type of organization that is able to levy a broad tax, and that's, of course, the government. Right, so the government is able to supply public goods and, and often does. You know, they provide the, the parks and, and they provide uh, some degree of protection, of course, and this is all based upon levying a broad tax across the population. But in a lot of other cases, because there is no organization that is able to do so, a lot of these previously shared goods and services, they, they no longer are being actually shared. So we can actually apply these same six characteristics across many of these very well-known sharing economy platforms that we're very familiar with today. And I have a bunch of them just here on, on the slide here. And there's some interesting points to highlight. So if you first look at the idea of an on-demand sharing economy, you'll notice that for the most part, across the board, you still do have quite a lot of uh, platforms today that still stick to this ideal of being on demand. There's two in particular that I wanted to highlight, WeWork and Wikipedia, that from the get-go did not plan to be on demand. WeWork, it, you actually need to buy into that service, subscribe into that service beforehand. You, don't, you can't necessarily just show up one day and say, I want a desk. And for Wikipedia, that's also asynchronous in a sense that people are voluntarily sharing their knowledge and insights whenever it is convenient for them. And then hopefully, you know, if you're looking for some knowledge, it's, it's already there. You know? and, and because it's scaled to such a great extent, more than likely, you know, if you are looking for some general knowledge, Wikipedia has some degree of coverage of it, but it, it, wasn't, ever, it wasn't ever planned to be um, on demand. The idea of an exchange of value now this one also is, for the most part, it's still very much retained by most of these platforms, say for Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a completely free service, and there's also no compensation for those people that are contributing. The third item, which is scalability. Now this is very important to most sharing economies, especially since a lot of these platforms became really successful <coughs> based upon internet technology. And it's because they've been able to use the internet that they've then scaled up to such a great extent. And across the board, you see this is a, a key component that's still very, very heavily retained by most of these platforms, all of these platforms, I should say. Now, interestingly enough, the idea of utilization, this is a driving point as to why most of these sharing economies actually were popular when they first started. They played upon the idea that, guess what, you know, you have all these products, you have all these goods and services that you've already paid for as an individual. You have a car, maybe two or three cars sitting in a garage. You have houses, you have apartments, you have even perhaps workspace that's not being fully utilized. Well, here's the idea of a sharing economy. You can then utilize these idle assets and be able to contribute something more to the economy, make it more efficient, and also do so for the greater good. For all those people out there that perhaps don't have a car, maybe they don't find it so convenient or maybe they can't afford one, they all of a sudden can still get rides. They can get rides from people that do have cars. Um, for people that are looking for just part-time work and people that are looking for people that uh, are able to provide this part-time work, they can provide it and they can also receive it. But perhaps most interestingly, uh, across all these platforms nowadays, the idea of the activation of idle assets no longer is front and center. So this is interesting. You're probably thinking, well, what about Uber and Lyft? You know, it, it seems like you're still activating these idle assets by 
taking a ride from somebody else, you know, who just so happens to have a car. Well, yes, perhaps, but something also to be um, to note is that Uber is also financing cars. So people that don't have a car but are interested in earning a uh, salary, earning uh, some degree of a wage from Uber, they are taking out loans and Uber's helping them to do so to buy new cars and put them on the road and be a part of Uber's network. So those are not idle assets, those are new assets that were bought up just for this purpose. We work, for example, never started out as, as basically trying to activate idle assets. As a user of WeWork, in fact, WeWork themselves, they bought property, they bought workspace, and then lease it out to people on a short-term basis. So again, not really activating idle assets there either. Mobike, Ofo, you know, the examples go on. These bikes, they weren't there before. <coughs> they have taken tens of millions of dollars of VC money to manufacture these bicycles that didn't exist before and put them onto the streets so that people can use them. So as you can see, the original idea of, of activating these idle assets really isn't in play for a lot of these platforms. And that's, that's pretty interesting. We'll get into a little bit more as to why that is and how we got to this situation. There are a few platforms that still do focus on this aspect of, of idle assets and activating them. And that include, they include Upwork, Wikipedia, and eBay. Next, the peer-to-peer -peer nature of sharing economies. It's also a bit of a mixed bag here. We have a couple that are still using them, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, Upwork, and eBay, but also quite a few that do not. And these include WeWork, Mobile Ovo, again, Wikipedia, and Lending Club. So again, a few examples as to why it's not peer-to-peer -peer any longer. We work, I, I think the example is quite clear. It's, this is a, a business, it's a platform that's actually providing space for individuals, so certainly not individuals to individuals. Same goes for Mobike and Ofo. Lending Club started out as peer-to-peer, -peer, where people, individuals were lending money, perhaps in a, in a large you know, uh, basis than spreading out the risk, but it was still generally people to people. Well, nowadays, major financial institutions are actually looking to Lending Club as a means of loan origination. They're going there looking for higher yields because of the big data they've been able to, to glean from a lot of the user base and be able to split that out by tranches as to the credit score and, and risk profile of some of these, of these loans. And so financial institutions have partnered with Lending Club. And Lending Club has been very happy to provide them with, with access to these loans. Again, this is no longer peer-to-peer. -peer. This is going back to the idea of incumbents, large corporations, large incumbents that are dominating the space. And last but certainly not least, the sense of community. The idea that a lot of these sharing economies bring together a group of people with similar ideals and a sense of belonging. Well, that may have been the story that was sold to a lot of people. That certainly isn't the case today. In fact, the only example of that still being true is, very interestingly enough, again, Wikipedia. And it's also worth noting that Wikipedia also is different from all these platforms in that they've never taken a single dollar of VC or PE financing. And for that reason, there, there may also be some um, differences between Wikipedia, how they operate, versus these other sharing economy platforms. So a couple of problems that I, that I want to highlight. Now, before I jump into this, I don't want to characterize these six defining characteristics of that necessarily important or necessary in order to have a successful sharing economy. Sharing economies, there's so many different types of them today, and you know, we really want to focus, I really want to focus on what makes a sharing economy actually useful to society. And that's some of the, uh, the latter characteristics that I highlighted on the previous slide. One of them uh, especially is the idea of activating those idle assets and the peer-to-peer -peer decentralized nature of it. But the problems that we have currently, number one, includes the idea of a winner-take-all phenomenon that currently exists within oftentimes most of these internet businesses. And it's the idea that you know, you're number one in your space or you're dead. There is no number two, number three, number four, at least not in the long term. You know, you could try to struggle for a while, but eventually that, that platform that has scale, that has been 
in the number one spot for quite some time, they take over. And just think of any internet company that comes to mind and, and you can see that uh, in action. So the idea of a winner take all phenomenon, it's driving the idea that in order to not just be successful, but to survive, you need to take VC financing. Because if you don't, your competitor will. And the competitor is going to take those tens of billions of dollars and scale much more quickly and across much, many more regions than you could ever do so without taking money until eventually you're number two or you're number three, right? And so the, the writing is very clear on the wall. In order to be successful or even have a chance at being successful, you've got to take the money. And oftentimes it's VC money that you're taking. So the end result, unfortunately, is as you're taking this VC money, there are strings attached, very heavy strings attached. And it leads to a fixation on return on investment via more scaling, right? Scaling perhaps beyond what is necessarily even necessary for that platform at that point in time, perhaps even scaling beyond the original vision of that platform, often leading to um, the uh, issuing of, of many of those characteristics that I just mentioned, and it becomes very problematic. A second problem is that the idea of activation of underutilized assets being asset light, right? Everyone loves the idea of being asset light, not only so much, but being able to use the same degree of, of benefit um, by, by utilizing these shared goods. That no longer applies. And if you recall from the previous slide, few if any of these platforms are actually asset light or allow us as customers and consumers to be asset light. Third, rather than being uh, focused on building value within the community and the ecosystem, most of the value nowadays accrues to the platform itself. So this isn't necessarily a problem in itself, but the original pitch that we all received by these platforms is that, you know what, there's all these major incumbents in place, and they're unfair to the consumer, they've created the rules, and we want to disrupt. There's that word, right? Everyone wants to be disrupted. Everyone wants to be innovative. And they want to come you know, from a small player, you know, David versus Goliath, and be able to knock down the big guy and create a new, fair system. Well, unfortunately, that's, that's just a pitch. Uh, if you think about all the major sharing economy platforms nowadays, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, WeWork, they're the incumbents now. They have tens of billions of market cap, and they're the ones that are able to use their capital to be able to run into new markets, use their capital for regulatory arbitrage purposes, use their capital to hire lawyers and lobbyists. So the idea of them being these small upstarts, disruptive, innovative upstarts, that's really just a dream. It's really just a pitch that they continue to pitch to us when in fact, they themselves have become the incumbents. And the value that accrues to those platforms is certainly not uh, any value that accrues to people that use those platforms. Finally, uh, as I mentioned before, these, these platforms, they, as they enjoy regulatory arbitrage, essentially not playing by the same rules as the previous incumbents played by, they further exacerbate the idea of a, of a competitive market and smaller upstarts that may in fact be even more so innovative or perhaps provide even more value through different business models, they can no longer compete. They haven't achieved scale, and others that have are going to stay in that incumbent position. So a lot of problems that have arose when we've allowed these sharing economy platforms, so to speak, to scale to the size they are today. So getting to the meat of the presentation, interesting you know, summary of sharing economies, but what does this have to do with blockchain? What does this have to do with cryptocurrency? So a couple challenges that I've highlighted and some potential solutions to those problems. Not to say that tokens and, and cryptocurrency is a panacea for all of these challenges, but there's a few interesting ideas that could be applied to help move us towards the right direction. So that first problem of there being a tendency to take VC money then leads to a fixation on ROI and scaling 
Well, of course, you can you can do a fundraising via a token sale instead, and that right now really levels the playing field because good ideas can still, based upon their merit, raise quite a lot of money very quickly. And of course, you know, good ideas can be can raise money from VC and PE. But the thing is, those VC firms are gatekeepers in themselves, and there is, of course, a, a hierarchy. There is a uh, dynamic to that, and you need to be able to play that game in order to to get that funding. And that funding is highly competitive at the moment to get. And for the time being, for companies that have a very interesting idea and an innovative approach to new to to existing problems in industries, they still have a very good chance of raising a good amount of money to be able to execute on that idea. And inflation, the aspect of inflation, we'll, I'll get into in just a moment. Second problem, asset heavy rather than being asset light. Well, related to the token sale as well, you can reduce the priority on scaling and bring it back to the idea of having an asset light sharing economy. Third, value accruing to the platforms rather than to the individuals, to the participants. But with the idea of tokens, and tokens representing ownership of the protocol that's being developed, ownership of the ecosystem that's being developed, value then more readily accrues to the token holders rather than just purely to the platforms themselves. But this is caveated with, a, with the idea that you need to be able to create a very functional token economy. Creating the right economic framework and incentives is very important to actually being able to achieve this idea of value occurring to the token holders, and that's not really not easy to do. Fourth challenge, as I mentioned, so with these new incumbents, they've taken all of this power, oftentimes regulatory arbitrage in a lot of these key markets, and have created a very anti-competitive environment. Well, this is a, a to-be-determined uh, aspect of token economics, but if we can create a regulatory framework that is more consistently applied within jurisdictions as well as across jurisdictions, then I think we have a much better chance of leveling, leveling the playing field, so to speak, and making it more competitive. <coughs> so bringing us to a specific example, the knowledge industry. So the reason I bring this up is because Red Pulse actually does implement many of the ideas that I've shared with you just now, the idea of using a tokenized economy to create a new type of sharing economy. I do want to give the example of how are we doing so for the knowledge industry. But first, a few observations about knowledge information. So if you can map out across uh, three different axes, along the bottom, a spectrum between general knowledge and specialized knowledge on the left side, and then on the left axis, uh, the number of interested consumers and the right axis, the willingness to pay. Now, what we've noticed is that in terms of the number of interested consumers for general knowledge is, of course, quite high. You know, everyone wants to know, okay, what's, what's the main point of, of today? You know, what, what are the key points, key developments that I really need to know about? Because that's just the baseline. You know, if I don't know that, then you know, I don't have the basics down. So that's, that's why for general knowledge is such a high a demand for it and, and very high number of interested consumers. Now as you go out to the right towards the long tail, of course more specialized knowledge, there's fewer interested parties because it is that niche. You know, how many people are really interested in how nuclear technology has developed in China over the last six months? It's an interesting topic, but there's just not as many people that are interested in how interest rates have changed in the last six months. So that's that describes the long tail. There. Now, very interesting is on the right side, we can map out the willingness to pay versus general knowledge and specialized knowledge. And it's, it's almost the, the exact opposite in the case here. Nowadays, most people, most financial institutions, most corporates, they're not willing to pay for general knowledge anymore. Banks, other corporates that are under budgetary pressure, um, they have their own internal research teams, and so much of that information covering general information, general markets, is already out there for free. Where everyone has access to blogs, there's Bloomberg, there's Thomson Reuters, there's Financial Times, the list goes on. And so people have now gone into the in, into the habit of getting all this information for free. Now moving out to the right side, specialized knowledge, 
where you don't have as easy access to that kind of information, people actually are very willing to pay for that information. In fact, pay quite a lot for that information. So it's these two observations. Financial institutions and corporates are no longer willing to pay for general information. Number two, these same institutions are willing to pay for specialized, bespoke insights. So before I get into further the tokenized sharing economy, how this applies to Red Pulse, which is the platform that, that I run, we started out as a more conventional research platform covering China. But as we started to think about the space and, and solve the observations that we made, you know, number one, not interested in general information, number two, um, they are interested in paying for specialized information. What we did was we created a tokenized platform that basically incentivizes people to contribute their ideas on, on markets and, and to do so using cryptocurrency and to share that information on a free basis to the institutional clients. Now, as we have seen, the second observation that we made was these same institutions are willing to pay for custom bespoke insights. The second part of our business model is to then include the idea of custom research requests that can be requested by our network. And that really allows those same institutions to request the information that they truly do need and aren't able to find anywhere else. And that's generally the idea of what we're doing at Red Pulse. And the overall idea of a sharing economy can be summed up like so. So you have participants, you also have common goods. And if you think back to the idea of a village where you had these participants initially, you had these common goods and services, people were very happy to participate, share, and benefit without any sort of transactional or incentives in place. As we scaled, and in the example from before, to tens of millions of people living in the same city, we then have the advent of fiat money that's being used to incentivize people. And so it became much more transactional. People were only willing to contribute to common goods that they were being compensated for it. And it lost a lot of the idea of sense of community, also as we saw just previously, uh, the activation of idle assets, so on and so forth. Now if we add a utility token layer in between fiat and common goods, this is where it gets more interesting because as an example, people that are opting into this sort of economic framework and this economic framework being then controlled not by government, but by either a foundation or some other entity that has created this economic framework around this utility token. Well, one example of what you can do with this is you can create an inflation mechanism. Essentially mint new tokens on a very small but continuous basis, but for a very good purpose. The minting of these new tokens is thus the source of capital that you can use to compensate those people that can contribute to the common good and thereby eliminate the need on a very transactional one-off basis to pay for that particular common good. It's really that tax that originally only a government could levy. Now a foundation, now a entity that has control and management over the utility token can levy that same tax. And in doing so, create a very fair system for people to be contributing. There are no free freeloaders or free riders in this case, and thereby allowing everyone to enjoy those same goods again. So challenges and trends ahead. I'll go through this quickly, I know I'm out of time. Uh, creation of a fair and transparent token economy framework is not easy to do. So you have to spend time being able to balance decentralized versus centralized. The reliance on automated, oftentimes imprecise, reputational scoring systems is part of this as well, and that's intended to replace centralized authority. And again, this is not easy to do. Shifting crypto regulations, we all know how quickly things change in different markets and jurisdictions, very problematic. And finally, as a trend, not necessarily a challenge, incumbents and existing business models are pivoting towards token economies. There's no longer a couple kids with a white paper in a garage. These are real companies that have revenues and profits that are now looking at token economies. And this is certainly not a bad thing. So to conclude, I'd like to also present Red Pulse as one great example of a sharing economy 
based on crypto uh, currency, based on token economics. And what we're doing is creating a sharing economy for knowledge. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions or do we need to move on to the next one? Okay, sure. So you bring up a very important thing, the village is not located in the I I don't know for certain, but uh, I think it's a great question. The the curve back to the idea of more of a egalitarian uh, benefit for all, I think is going to be much more rapid than than you know the past several thousand years and mainly because of technology so if you see how quickly these internet based platforms have gone from zero to tens of billions of dollars in terms of market cap and also huge impact on oftentimes billions of people that happened in a matter of a decade or two and i think we'll see something just as quick if not quicker come about from from you watching thank you Great question. Yeah, so typically they're people that already are familiar with cryptocurrencies, with tokens. And for us, because our clientele consists of financial institutions and corporates, that's, that's one challenge. But also, much more um, closer to your question, the people that are producing the content are oftentimes experienced professionals that have been in the industry for quite some time. And the business model that we're trying to focus on, that we're modeling our token economy on, is a conventional expert network. So you may have heard of GLG, Third Bridge, Alpha Sites, and these are very big businesses and very lucrative business models. And they've been able to leverage these massive networks of, of experts, academics, people that are practitioners in these fields, to act as experts that are then uh, hired on a hourly basis to buy these hedge funds. But these experts, they could be 40, 50, 60 years old. You know, they've been working for a while and they don't necessarily know what cryptocurrencies are. And if they do know what they are, they may not necessarily be interested in using them. Uh, so that's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, but we do have a, a solution to that. We've partnered with a platform called NEX, which is a decentralized payment gateway and exchange. And they're, they're essentially allowing us to install a widget in our platform that allows for more seamless fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat exchange without either end, either user demographic having to touch crypto. So that's, that's pretty interesting for us. Okay, uh, no other questions. Thank you so much for listening to my, my talk. One more keynote speaker, and then we will enter our uh, panel section where everybody can raise their hands and ask questions. And uh, I need to mention that Repos is actually the first project on Neo Network. And uh, like Epiphany, we are also built on Neo Network. And then uh, let me introduce you to another um, Neo project. The PDS Credit Exchange, uh, the keynote speaker, Sarah John, the founder of PDS. Thank you all. Uh, so, uh, good evening, and uh, uh, very happy to be here at Denver and talk about points. Uh, which is also abbreviated as TTS. Our goal is to uh, build a next generation blockchain based credit service network. Uh, just a little bit by way of background, uh, I first came across with the uh, cryptocurrency and also blockchain 
five years ago here in Silicon Valley when I was working for Team Street First at Accelerator. And that was an interesting time because Team uh, spent all those money acquiring the uh, uh, Bitcoins that was uh, taken from uh, by FBI from the Silk Road. Uh, at that time, Ethereum wasn't uh, developed yet. And there was a lot of discussions around what's the use case for this. And five years have passed. Uh, I'm also running a uh, blockchain center called uh, DCAN in Beijing, which is a development network. So everyone can see there are many, many very interesting uh, work uh, going on uh, in this industry, uh, which uh, brought me to decide that I'm going to uh, actually build a project, blockchain chain based uh, project. Uh, by myself as well. Uh, my, my training is mostly in public policy and also uh, MBA. Uh, did work uh, as a product manager at Amazon uh, and also built a developer uh, community for a robotics company. Uh, there are three of us for this project. Uh, my co-founder Kate, uh, he is more, she is more technical and she is a CMU graduate uh, in CS and uh, she also managed the uh, uh, what's interesting is she actually managed Singapore and Malaysia's Xiaomi uh, uh, operations. Uh, I, I don't know, like Xiaomi uh, is very good at those viral marketing kind of things, which which we find very similar uh, dynamics between the crypto world right now. Uh, together, uh, together, uh, and, and and going forward, I think that's actually important for those type of DR projects to uh, go mainstream. Uh, our chief scientist is actually a center professor here, uh, Mr. Uh, professor Zhang Zhoucheng, and he's providing us with a lot of guidance on those. Uh, so, uh, why did we decide to do this? Uh, everyone now knows that the DLT uh, distributed ledger technology is shaping the foundation of our financial system. Essentially, uh, because uh, all about finance is about how to price risk, and all about risk pricing is depends on uh, uh, a data. Uh, what type of data do you have? Uh, so, and blockchain is uh, fundamentally uh, to a big extent a database. Uh, technology. So we think uh, by building a data marketplace uh, that, that is quite related would be a very interesting and uh, a useful infrastructure for shaping the financial uh, industry in the in the era to come. Mm. So uh, we decided to actually, uh, I know there are uh, many uh, wonderful projects here at, at Stanford and also in the Valley about uh, a similar topic, how to uh, build uh, better credit markets. And um, so I, I'm going, and also the previous speaker already talked about uh, how, why uh, the, the, when system, uh, system sales for credit information got leaked was a big problem. I would like to add a little bit more insight uh, speaking from the developing country perspective. Uh, it's uh, probably shocking to know that even for a uh, country like China nowadays, only 30% people have any type of credit history. Uh, and 70% uh, uh, of the Chinese actually don't have any uh, borrowing kind of uh, history at all. Uh, so uh, that situation is quite uh, similar in Latin America, uh, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia. So nowadays there are still uh, billions of people who are actually invisible in the current credit system, especially in the FICO type of uh, credit system because uh, uh, FICO is very uh, skilled towards using direct lending related data to do a credit scoring. Uh, so, uh, so, but uh, however, uh, I think it's very uh, interesting because even for those people who don't have any credit history, so to speak, it doesn't mean they don't have any variable data uh, that can describe uh, their credit worthiness. Uh, how, uh, those data is quite spread out. Uh, if we can actually build a shared database for those, uh, we can actually uh, improve the data consistency and improve the credit system by a lot. However, there are a lot of uh, trust issues in the current uh, data, credit data marketplace. Mm -hmm. So for the financial institutions, um, uh, they lack of incentives to share the credit related data with each other, uh, primarily because of uh, trust concerns. If I have to share the raw data about my customers, then I risk losing uh, the customer to my competitor. But that's one of the main concerns. Uh, there are also other non-financial type of data 
uh, which can be used to uh, do quite a scoring. For example, uh, e-commerce data, social network data. However, those data is mostly uh, uh, saved in the non-financial institutions, and uh, a lot of them they are not motivated to contribute data in data sharing uh, because it's not their main business and uh, uh, they don't have any rewards for doing this. And uh, also the biggest mi missing chunk and a very interesting channel for this are the uh, actual individuals. If we think about it, uh, for example, for e-commerce data, uh, which describes what type of person I am, uh, I spend my own money on a platform like Amazon. However, uh, the those platforms uh, hold those data and if the credit rating agency <coughs> couldn't access that data about myself, then I cannot get a score. So there's a very big misalignment between the benefits uh, of the, uh, the ownership uh, of the uh, data, personal data. And of course, there's also huge con uh, con concerns around privacy, protection, proper conditions, etc., etc. So given all those pieces, uh, it's very uh, uh, ridiculous in a way that while, as we covered, uh, there's massive amount of data uh, that's not currently co co collected. Uh, actually, uh, for the data that is being collected, the financial institutes, they actually um, collect those data uh, separately, and they actually also did a lot of redundant work. Uh, and uh, a, a new trend in the uh, data scoring business, uh, credit scoring business itself is, as I mentioned, to move beyond the traditional FICO model and into a more machi uh, machine learning based uh, scoring model, which can take advantage of all those very uh, interesting new variables besides just the uh, credit history itself. Uh, however, uh, because uh, for the, the, the AI, uh, for for AI, the foundation is very the availability and also accuracy of data. Uh, so this missing piece uh, on infrastructure level led to a sub uh, suboptimal situation. So uh, that's why we decided to build PTS. And uh, then we look really deep into this industry and find that this is a very demanding uh, industry in terms of uh, being a blockchain, uh, blockchain based uh, type of solution. Although uh, we know blockchain based solution can provide a lot of the benefits that will address the, uh, uh, the, the pain points that we just discussed. Uh, in fact, uh, in able to uh, to be able to handle uh, to make an actual viable type of uh, credit and uh, data marketplace, the transaction per second, which is the performance uh, the performance uh, requirement, uh, needs to be uh, above a hundred thousand uh, for this type of uh, project to actually go into production. And uh, in China, uh, and, uh, what's very interesting is that there's even much higher latency requirement as well. Because uh, right now, uh, all the lending platforms, uh, they, uh, what they promote is uh, you have to uh, get your loan approved within a couple of seconds, like one to three seconds. And, the, uh, and that's a very, very high uh, requirement as well. And uh, uh, so, and we have a problem that uh, we do have actually data uh, cornerstone data contributors who are actually willing to uh, contribute uh, up to uh, 500 million uh, people's uh, uh, individual credit related variables. And that's a massive size uh, to handle. So uh, that's kind of the Mm, that that that's that's kind of the requirement we face, and we had to. And and as as everyone knows, there's still a lot of work that's being done uh, on the infrastructure level for the uh, public chains, etc. And, and the current consensus models, and we have uh, we had to uh, compare those solutions, or and also conduct innovative designs in terms of uh, scaling. Uh, but uh, how would this PDS uh, network actually work? I think in in short, it would sort of work like a a uh, online super, uh, supermarket uh, for using data. Uh, of course, uh, uh, granting that you actually have the permission, then it will, uh, when the model uh, providers or the financial institutes 
they use their own models, uh, which is typically a, a logistical regression. And uh, the, the, the model calls an entire network um, for all the vendors of those variable data. And there's a repetition system for each data source as well. Uh, then uh, when you, you are able to collect the most accurate data at the uh, best uh, reasonable cost, uh, then the network will compute the credit score and return the result instead of the actual raw data uh, to the uh, to to the uh, uh, customer who is usually a, a lending uh, company who wants to evaluate the credit worthiness uh, of a uh, potential customer. So. Uh, how exactly uh, this is going to be better compared to the status quo? Uh, first of all, uh, we, we see this will help with the data quality improvement. Uh, it reduces the risk of losing data due to the failure of centralized database. Uh, and also, uh, we can calibrate data from multiple sources over time. Uh, so basically, uh, you can imagine there's a quality inspector uh, which is the algorithm that's running running on the network. Uh, there are the same type of variable data that's provided by multiple sources, and uh, you can check with multiple sources and see uh, among those sources to see uh, whether one data source uh, for the same data is uh, very different from everyone else, and that's a good way of checking consistency and scoring the reputation for different uh, data sources. And also, uh, we see uh, the benefits of cost reduction uh, because we can reduce the need to repetitively procure and uh, record the same data uh, for the same customer. Uh, and because we were able to bring more clarity about what type of data is already available on the network and what's not, uh, we can help to expand uh, the data coverage as well, especially uh, with the personal direct data contribution uh, that will uh, help in two ways. One is that uh, uh, we will compensate people for their uh, uh, direct contribution or with their permission. Uh, that is actually going to be uh, typically lower cost compared to if you actually use those data from an enterprise level source. Uh, and at the same time, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in a country like China, 70% uh, people own their, uh, they don't have like quite a history data, but uh, they do have their uh, uh, other type of data about themselves, which they can uh, contribute. And uh, of course, as an aggregate of all, 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 all of those, because a better credit market plays, uh, we will be able to actually build uh, better credit rating models. So how are we going to, uh, what type of uh, innovations are we working on? And uh, uh, we also look for partners and ideas, suggestions just about how to further design those things very well. First of all is to uh, actually uh, have a very high performance consensus network. network. Uh, we are uh, right now, because uh, as the scaling uh, requirement and also the, the latency requirement we are facing right now, so our design is based on DPO, <coughs> and also uh, we will uh, introduce this concept of uh, deposits uh, so that if you actually deposit more uh, a monetary amount that is uh, higher than the uh, potential cost for using those data, then we can uh, ask, uh, process your request uh, without uh, before all the confirmation has been uh, uh, has been made. That way, uh, we can delay the actual uh, calculation and the confirmation process at a later stage. However, that doesn't delay uh, when the user can uh, use those those data. So that uh, speaking from this uh, use case itself. Uh, we try to explore other ways uh, to reach a demanding requirement for a certain use case uh, so that we can uh, start to build uh, uh, applications that can be used in production even given the relatively um, still evolving early stage uh, infrastructure. And uh, zero knowledge proof, 
uh, is also going to be hugely relevant for this type of use case. Because as I uh, explained, a lot of the data, data market uh, place trust issues is uh, about whether uh, that I do not want to expose my raw data. Although I don't mind if you use the aggregate statistical result that's being calculated from what I contributed, but uh, um, for various reasons, I do not want to expose those raw data. And zero knowledge proof is uh, very uh, re relevant because now we can actually enable that. Uh, uh, there are a very interesting work here at Stanford uh, uh, with Professor Dan Bunet's lab, and uh, we are very uh, interested in, in embedding some of those work into our system design as well. Uh, and also for the smart contract itself, uh, it automates the trade negotiation and enforcement of those uh, of those transactions by smart contracts, which is uh, make it uh, much more fair and efficient uh, and lower cost as well. Uh, security is very important. Uh, we use decentralized uh, secure data storage and exchange via uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography. Uh, it is uh, safe. The data is saved in the uh, secure Dropbox, where <coughs> only uh, people who have the private key can open it. And as a platform, we will not have any uh, access to our data partners or uh, individual contributors. Um, so, uh, what type of uh, things? Uh, instead of saying this is a business model, it's more like, uh, uh, let's see how this type of credit data marketplace can change the future of finance. Uh, things can be very different uh, based on this type of uh, database and also the uh, risk pricing that can be done based on it. Uh, for example, for lending, uh, actually a lot of the thing filers and the, right now uh, the, the subprime grade the lenders uh, can can uh, over time start to build the credit history uh, to get to the prime gate grade and access cheaper credit options. And what's even more interesting is that uh, in, uh, in 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 some countries such as China, the government right now banned uh, the, sub, the the consumer loans to uh, to certain uh, certain groups, so the interest rate cannot be higher than a mandated uh, rate, which is 36 percent, which is much lower than the market rate for those type of thing filers. And uh, if we now allow people to also use data contribution as a part of their uh, interest payment, essentially we can actually lower their uh, cash payment. Uh, to ensure that uh, such kind of interest uh, requirement can be enforced. And because if we have better uh, credit rating, uh, we can also do better asset back security investment by grouping uh, different rate of the uh, of, of those consumer debt and sell them in second uh, in packages on the secondary market, and that will allow the lenders to free up more capital to uh, make more loans to the people who actually uh, need to have access to capital. For insurance, uh, what's interesting is that uh, actually using uh, credit scores uh, actually help uh, with uh, improving the insurance policy underwriting as well. Uh, insurance companies start to use uh, credit scores in deciding on the uh, rate for different uh, applicants because uh, they see that the top 10 percentile, uh, the, the bottom 10 percentile uh, credit uh, score uh, applicants actually uh, is 30 per, uh, incurs 30 percent higher cost compared to the uh, top 10 percent applicants. So using those scores also helps with uh, uh, insurance to uh, provide better rates for uh, people with a high uh, re reputation. So yeah, and of course, uh, this idea can be applicable to other type of data exchanges as well. If you, you, you guys are also working on other type of data exchanges, I think there are a lot of uh, similar ideas, uh, and we can talk about that. And uh, because, uh, because, because this, this uh, blockchain-based solution is a very global from the beginning, we also see uh, right now the credit scores are not portable across countries. Uh, with this type of uh, design, uh, we can further help people to uh, create a more portable uh, credit, uh, credit scores across different countries. So uh, we are still uh, relatively uh, early uh, on, on, uh, on our project. So 
uh, but we are going to push out uh, our proof of concept uh, DR uh, next uh, next month. So and it will be uh, open open source will be on GitHub. So everyone is welcome to uh, come and contribute and give us suggestions. Uh, we are also uh, doing a prototype later this year and uh, hoping to uh, launch the full network uh, next year. So. And how does tokens can potentially play a role uh, in this type of uh, ecosystem? So lenders can use them to purchase credit uh, reports of the borrowers, and also uh, the data providers, especially the early ones, uh, will be rewarded uh, with uh, those tokens. So because uh, a big uh, problem with uh, a project like this is how do you cold start? I know a lot of the uh, quite a few part other projects would like to use more uh, peer staking type of ways to start, but we think that will be that that will take uh, quite a long time to uh, before accomplishing uh, usability. So we think we should uh, do a hybrid model to encourage both the institutions and the individuals to do those type of contribution and also uh, provide uh, rewards uh, with the early contributors. And also we encourage the developer community, the tech partners to but work together on this as well, and the partners will also be rewarded with those uh, tokens. Um, speaking about the regulations, uh, and uh, so uh, people, uh, everyone uh, may know that in China, the uh, regulations about ICOs itself is very, very strict. It's uh, entirely prohibited uh, right now. But I do want to clarify that uh, the government is very, very uh, supportive of blockchain-based uh, solution itself and financial technology itself. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, the PBOC, which is the Central Bank of China, uh, published a paper in January 19 this year, and specifically talking about uh, they see the blockchain technology will enhance the efficiency of sharing critical data, such as balance sheets, etc., to provide a, a more liquid secondary loan market. And uh, uh, they do think integrating this technology into financial service platforms should be part of the future strategy. So, uh, so, so, yeah. So, it, it, although. Uh, ICO is not uh, permitted uh, in this country, but uh, people are still very hopeful and seeing the value of this technology itself. And uh, we have already been able to lock down some uh, very good high quality data uh, cornerstone contributors. So that we, we do have, as I mentioned, we do have uh, data uh, that, that can cover uh, up to uh, more than 500 million of uh, Chinese individuals. And we're also looking for more partners. Uh, I know a lot of uh, you guys here are in uh, research fields. I think uh, it's, uh, it's exciting that uh, we were able to work with such a data set. Uh, if you are in the same field, uh, we are very happy to talk, to talk to you. And if you see this type of application is relevant to your um, companies, or you can be a potential user or contributor to this platform, even if you are in other countries, uh, I think PTS would be a, a good project to collaborate together as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a uh, quick overview of uh, our project. And hopefully, uh, I, I gave a slightly different perspective in introducing a specific problem that we're trying to solve and see how blockchain can play a role in it. Uh, and uh, we do think data marketplace, not only for credit, and for uh, many uh, other areas could be the killer app for blockchain. So uh, I also encourage you to uh, explore this area. And uh, it's a very impactful and uh, interesting area. Thank you. And uh, we are going to start our panel session right now. And uh, let's welcome our panelists. Thank <laughs> you. 
have uh, five panelists. I will be the hostess. Let's uh, first let every um, a panelist introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Benya. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Benya. I'm the uh, president, chief revenue officer, and board uh, director uh, for Seven Stars Cloud, which is a NASDAQ listed uh, public company. Uh, we're virtually in a kind of a startup mode. Uh, the previous entity that we took over was involved with video on demand programming distribution uh, into China and it didn't work out very well. So we kind of took the company over, decided that that wasn't a really good business model, and we said we should get into fintech. So that's what we've been doing for the past six months. And we've had a great start, uh, and I'll be happy to share more info with you during the networking session. Um, my background is actually in uh, infrastructure, uh, broadband, video. Uh, we started up with high-speed internet uh, back in 1999, 1998, roughly. I was involved with the whole startup of that operation for the cable industry. And prior to that, I was a cable operator for many years, uh, both in America and also in Scandinavia. So that's the background. Hi everyone, my name is Christine Chen. I'm the president of North America of Deeper Chen. Uh, Deeper Chen is an AI uh, computing platform driven by blockchain. Uh, we have a uh, dual headquarters both in Silicon Valley and back in Shanghai. We were just in Singapore. Uh, we can chat more after the section and we would like to share more information during the section. Hi, I'm Sarah again from CPS. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan from Red Pulse, and Red Pulse is a tokenized research e ecosystem covering China. Hi, uh, good evening. So we have entrepreneurs and investors, researchers, also uh, blockchain enthusiasts. So uh, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is April, and I come from Greenmart. Greenmart is a emerging digital asset trading platform, which was launched on March 15th this year. So um, I work in Bigmart as a compliance officer, so my ma main duty is to make sure that Bigmart stays compliant in all the major markets where I operate. So um, I'm also a licensed attorney in New York and New Jersey states. So currently my main focus is to study the current regulations uh, in cryptocurrency industry, especially for ICOs and for the exchange operation. Okay, so in order to give our audience some um, opportunity to ask questions, I will only have three questions for our panelists. The first one is that we often talk about blockchain uh, for its financial feature, financial nature, but uh, blockchain as an underlying technology is more than that. Like, uh, in your opinion, what can be another killer app built on blockchain? Well, I would say, I mean, any major industry like healthcare, uh, financial industry, <coughs> presentation, insurance companies, any major organizations that have very high administrative costs, uh, lots of expenses tied to, you know, um, receivables, payables, staff, I mean, taxes, you name it. And blockchain really simplifies a lot of things and makes things a lot more efficient. So. Name a big industry, and you know you're gonna you, you're gonna be able to use blockchain to solve a problem. Okay. So as you can see, there are many uh, creative and new applications of blockchain across a wide range of uh, industries. Uh, besides business uh, application, I don't think the killer application has yet to ma uh, materialize. Uh, we at Deeper and Chen, we think blockchain technology is a perfect vehicle for AI computing platform uh, to solve the two biggest issue of uh, blockchain uh, of AI industry. Uh, first one is uh, you can lower the cost by sharing the computing power, share the data, and then AI models on blockchain. The second one is they can secure the data um, by sharing the data with a smart contract. So uh, different chain, actually you can think about, uh, it can reduce the cost, uh, just the, the AI companies to pay the cost at a fraction of the cost. 
um, it's also a network for AI and data companies to connect. Um, there's so many, so a lot of data is lost uh, without anybody answer the question, and there's uh, data never be shared or rarely used. So cutting back the cost on the uh, hardware allows <coughs> company to focus on uh, innovation and um, their technology. Yeah. So I think. Uh, the killer app will be the AI plus blockchain. Uh, in a broader sense, if uh, there's an application that can decentralize the superpowers such as uh, Facebook, Uber, bank system, or AWS, it will be the real usage. So besides finance, uh, depends on the timeline to materialize. I think. Uh, Closer to being mature, uh, it could be content uh, monetization and IP related uh, things. For example, uh, some of the game producers start to put their uh, future IP onto a uh, blockchain based uh, crowdfunding platform where fans can choose to fund which project uh, they can build and also get a share of the uh, revenues. Uh, in the future, so and uh, for this type of uh, market, they actually have a lot of fans. But right now, the funding is very has a relatively uh, mono monopolized uh, supplies. So I think uh, and uh, together with a digital fingerprint that can better track uh, the uh, how how those IPs are used and how much money actually people make from those IPs. This could be an interesting use case. Uh, that's closer to being realized. Uh, and in the far out, uh, for example, in healthcare, uh, using uh, with very private uh, ways of computing, uh, as you mentioned, doing better AIs about uh, things such as uh, human genes, personalized medicine, et cetera, et cetera, could have a very big impact. But healthcare is a tougher field because uh, there's way more regulations, et cetera, et cetera, and also supporting AI is also a big topic. But I do think uh, that's possible over the long run and also it's going to be a big category. Well, I also tend to agree that there are quite a lot of applications for blockchain across industries and across healthcare, across logistics. I think any sort of application that requires a degree of verification for the information that's being stored and shared across the network, blockchain you know, obviously is, is a pretty interesting solution for that. But I do want to highlight, I think, a key challenge. We talked about a roadmap getting to an actual killer app status. And for the most part, we're not there yet. Why are we not there? My feeling is because there's a disconnect between what rests on the blockchain and the real world. I'll give you an example. If you look at healthcare and you want to track people's um, health, you know, on the blockchain, maybe their health records. Well, there is, of course, the records themselves, the information itself. But how does it get onto the blockchain? You know, if it's done by a doctor, well, that doctor has the potential for making a mistake. And if it's not by, done by a doctor, it could be done by a device. You know, IoT is, is a pretty big industry nowadays, but what if the device malfunctions, right? And, and taking it uh, to another application here, similar to healthcare, I suppose, but the idea of estate planning. You know, if, if someone decides to create a digital will where it determines who gets what at the time of death, right? So how do you distribute? It's a little bit morbid, I know. But how do you distribute your wealth amongst all your children and your grandchildren? Well, how does the smart contract know that you've died? I mean, are you going to be wearing a, a you know smart device and it's going to measure your heartbeat? And then when your, your heart stops beating, then the, the smart contract is activated and then all the funds are distributed. What, are you, what if you're just taking it off to go take a shower, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, so there's that disconnect between the blockchain world and the real world, which is an underlying reason for why we haven't really achieved a killer app status yet. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> I think basically our speakers have covered basically all the things I can think of. So um, I didn't have any technology background, so my understanding of blockchain technology might be very superficial. But I just heard Christian and Jonathan talk about 
smart contracts. So um, one day, some guy who works I work with told me uh, someday smart contract might replace lawyers. So that's terrifying for me because I'm a lawyer. So yeah. Uh, also, what's very impressive for me is how blockchain technology facilitates people's um, uh, alternative banking solutions and also uh, asset management system. Like. I work in BMART, so I'll just take BMART as an example. We are currently trying to add a very exciting new feature to our platform. You know, there are over 9,000 platforms currently and even more different kinds of tokens. So different platforms list different tokens. How to manage your digital assets is a tough question. So currently with this whole networking trading system, we can, I think users can trade across the multiple platforms with one single click. And a thousand a thousand transaction can be processed at the same time, which is very impressive to me. Yeah. Well, I know that's a very open discussion question. So next question is going to be a little bit more specific. Like uh, um, the SEC uh, had a lot of debate and also had a lot of new rules, especially for exchanges. Like you have to register with the SEC now for this ATS uh, license. And also uh, SEC said that uh, recently they said under the US law, every token is considered an equity token. I also wanted to ask our guest, what do you think about that statement? Well, we, uh, one of the, uh, our company is growing through acquisition and partnerships. We're not going to be um, hiring and managing armies all over the world. We're going to JV with everybody. And our focus has been on AI, cloud-based, blockchain, and alternative trading systems and platforms. So we bought the majority interest of a company called DBOT, D-B-O-T, Delaware Board of Trading. And you can go to DBOT trading.com and uh, trade. If you have OTC securities or uh, other types of securities that are eligible to be traded over the platforms, SEC and FINRA are regulated. So we really embrace regulation. We understand how important it really is if you want to survive in the financial world uh, as a multinational company. Um, but our strategy is basically to, we have a stack, we have code that allows us to do a lot of very interesting things in the financial space. One of the areas that we're really intrigued about is real estate, um, especially REITs, R-E-I-T, R-E-I-T, apostrophe S. REITs are very interesting. It's about a $3 trillion business, uh, $2 trillion of which is traded uh, through various funds, Vanguard, Fidelity, BlackRock, you name it. But there's about a trillion that are not traded. They're illiquid. And so what we want to do is to provide the digitization, securitization, and tokenization of those kinds of assets and fractionalize them and sell them and then enable trading through our network where we have an alternative trading system, DBOT. We have other partners like merchant bankers and stuff, and we have a stack in the middle of software that enables all of these things. It's all blockchain based. Um, since like the regulations are either outright banned or both some IOC and exchange uh, the current state, um, I think the later approach is more appropriate due to, uh, I think many regulators, they don't truly or fully understand the regulation and the regulation actually can uh, sci-fi the, the innovation and then regulation can also um, um, stop the company for moving forward. So I think um, what we are seeing about this emerging, uh, emerging technology is just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we need to uh, understand this industry more and to make sure uh, it's already been disclosed its full potential. So when that happens, we can uh, say the regulation we can do this way instead of that way. My personal opinion. So I actually tend to agree that 
um, tokens are security. I don't think they are um, equities. Because by definition, what is security? Security is it's a form of uh, certificate for uh, some type of rights and interests. And uh, 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 there are different types of rights. And uh, uh, most of the tokens nowadays do represent a, a certificate for ownership right to use, and oftentimes some type of right for uh, future benefits. And that's by a broader definition, that is the definition of a security. So, but whether we should use the same security law framework to regulate this new type of security, I think that's a different question. Uh, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, concerns for good reasons about uh, the being overregulated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I also hear relatively balanced opinion within the government itself as well. Uh, I actually read the entire notes for the congressional hearing at uh, at uh, by the by SEC in February, and uh, it's uh, actually very quite balanced. Uh, I think Clinton actually said uh, he takes the perspective as a father and saying that even if he is the chairman of SEC, his uh, his son. Who, who is a teenager was never excited about finance at all before uh, until his uh, high school classmate told him about Bitcoin. And he said, so my, my attitude towards this is very similar of being a dad. On one hand, I'm, uh, I'm afraid uh, my, 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 my kids will be uh, taken advantage of because of the misleading information and scams. But at the same time, we should not dismiss Millennials' uh, enthusiasm for this new type of uh, financial products, and I, I, I think that that's a, a very uh, nuanced attitude. Uh, in China, uh, the central bank chairman also said our approach towards crypto is dynamic. We want to see more pilots before we made up our mind on how to regulate this. So I think there are reasonable and rational voices. Uh, within the governmental uh, organizations as well. And I hope those kind of type of rational thinking and reasonable regulation will surface over time. So generally speaking, I, I think regulations are helpful to an industry's development, especially relative to where we are today. We are such uh, at early days in terms of the cryptocurrency um, environment that I think more regulations are, are critically needed and you just need to look at previous to you know having all of these countries ban cryptocurrencies and ban ICOs what was generally speaking the large majority of the projects and companies that were doing ICOs they were not robust they were not uh, well you know based companies that had fundamentally um, solid business models driving their their need for fundraising. Um, a lot of them were frauds. You know, a lot of them were basically just mechanisms to to raise a whole lot of cash and and run away with it. And I think many of these jurisdictions saw that for what it was and moved very swiftly to ban these ICOs across the board. Now, unfortunately, for those and very much so the people on this panel that have viable projects and the have viable companies that aim to use the idea of tokenization and blockchain as part of their, their business and as part of their underlying technology, that's problematic because we get pulled in, we get categorized much the same as all these other um, fraudulent companies, all these other you know bad apples, and it, it basically restricts us. It limits our ability to use the technology and also create a a successful business model around that technology. So having more clear regulations that define what is allowable and what's not allows us to operate in much more um, clear space and allows us to operate in a way where there's more certainty as to what we're doing. Uh, is, it, is it okay? Is it legal? Without having to continue to operate in the gray. So um, basically, I agree with Jonathan that I heard lots of people complaining we have too many regulations right now. But the truth is, I believe the regulations are not enough in the way that regulations are not clear enough to give people guidance. So um, to answer Nicole's question, whether 
tokens are actually securities, for me, the answer is depends. It always depends. So, you know, except SEC, we also have other regulators. We have IRS, who said tokens are properties. They have FinCEN, who said they're all currencies. We also have CFTC and SEC. So, um, it's, a cur it's, current, it, it's actually very interesting that legislative bodies remain silent when different regulators are trying to struggling to, to dispute with each other, try to grab some piece of cake from the, try to burn this new whole industry into their own territory. So um, my concern is, I think the question, the fundamental question needs to be answered by the legislative body. If we cannot pass a law to properly identify whether tokens are commodities or securities or currency or whatever, we need to have the judges or court decisions to give us clear guidance. And I believe uh, in March there is a federal judge, Winston, who has ruled in his decision in banking the FTC's finding that uh, tokens are actually commodities. So. <coughs> That, that, that's official law. So that is uh, actually persuasive to me because if you ask yourself a question, if you buy a token and SEC said it's a security, but traditionally security always represents security interest. So it's either uh, adapted to the company or uh, you have a active interest to manage the business, to control the company. So what did you get? That's the question, except for investment return. That's my, that's my concern, too. I think our investors also need to be educated instead, uh, besides those regulations for the ICO issuers and the exchange operators. Uh, so currently, actually, I've heard people complaining, but the truth is I rarely see anyone actually ask me. I've heard lots of questions like, is ICO even legal in China or US? But instead, people don't ask me how to legalize ICO. You know, ICO as a form of fundraising is actually legal. Just you have to abide by the security law, uh, 1933 Securities Act, which only uh, asks you to register. So our regulators actually are very lenient in a way that CFTC only asks you to implement a self-certification system. And also, SEC is not trying to kill this whole industry. They are not smothering those startup companies. They are making a case-by-case -case decision. They are not just killing all those companies who do ICO because they fail to register. They are killing those companies because all those promotional materials they have contain fraudulent information misrepresentation, misleading information, which are basically, in a word, a scam. So they're trying to protect investors and also trying to make our industry healthier. So just welcome the regulations and do some research or hire a professional office to help you with those compliance issues. That would be very easy. Okay, my last question would be, what do you think blockchain will be by the end of this year? Because right now it's April and we have many months to go. But in this industry, everything happens very, very fast. Maybe just overnight as a new different world. So what do you think uh, by this end of the year, blockchain will be? Well, I think there's a lot of momentum. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion though as well. And I went through this for like, we were starting up broadband. People really didn't understand what it meant. Everybody had uh, dial-up. It was very, very frustrating. You get kicked off. It was very slow. Uh, and we solved a big problem. But as we went to all these, these small towns and introduced the product, it was called Roadrunner, uh, which was a great name, uh, people just didn't really understand it. And it took a lot of education and um, evangelism. Uh, and finally, we kind of hit an inflection point you know, after the first couple of years. You know, technology was sort of clunky, uh, and we were kind of patching it together to force the solution, if you will. And then ultimately, we, we developed more elegant solutions like USB, 
you can self-install your high-speed internet. Back when we were starting it, it, two technicians had to show up at your house. And we literally had to open up your PC, which caused our attorneys to have great, you know, they were very afraid of, of the implications of, let's say a movie <coughs> director has a film on his PC and our PC technicians cracks open the PC, put in a network interface card to connect with the data center to get high speed and all of a sudden his hard drive gets blown up. What's the uh, legal uh, situation with that, right? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I, I, I really think that, you know, we talked about a lot of very interesting things here. We had a great panel, great moderator, great forum. There needs to be a lot of evangelism and education. Uh, I think that's really, very, very critical because, uh, you know, the, 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 if you talk to an average consumer, right, who's reading the newspaper and you say blockchain, what do you think they say? They say Bitcoin. Yeah. They think it's Bitcoin. And that's exactly the opposite. Bitcoin is going to be a fractional aspect of blockchain. That's what's missing, is the evangelism and the education about the power of 62 lines of code, right? And how you can customize it and really make it very powerful and important, similar to what we went through with taking dialogue and going to broadband and now Broadband is like oxygen. People can't live without it. We should uh, do a deprivation, uh, a broadband deprivation study and see how long people can last without it. I don't think it's gonna be very long. I think blockchain technology can draw a parallel to the, uh, the internet uh, in early, early uh, in early uh, 1999. Um, so, Besides, um, when, when we were still using the dial up, uh, we hardly can predict how this technology will, uh, the internet will in, uh, strongly impact, impact our daily life in modern days. Um, so just say internet itself in the uh, decentralized flow of data and information, um, it allows the technology to grow. It um, help the industry to go to another level. So it's really hard to say now uh, this blockchain, where this emerging technology, where the way will go. And um, I feel like um, at different chain, we just uh, use artificial intelligence to help blockchain become smarter. Um, although there's so many laws, as we say, we have to surpass and then we need to improve a lot of things. Um, like the process of ICO need to uh, um, com uh, figure out it first, right? So I think end of this year, um, I think people still figure, trying to figure out the blockchain is a commodity or is a currency or um, or it's just a security. Uh, we, we will figure out better usage moving forward. Um, um, but for now, we still need to uh, do the focus on the regulation and protect the young investor. Um, I think three things. Uh, first, more people will be able to tell the difference of Bitcoin and blockchain. Two, uh, more protocols, uh, more work on different type of consensus models will emerge. And the third thing will be further globalization of this industry uh, because we already see people moving from jurisdiction where this stricter regulations to uh, faces that's uh, more friendly. Uh, and because of the uh, decentralized collaboration model of this industry itself, uh, this is going to be one of the uh, most globalized industries uh, that we have seen in most decades. Well, I think for 2018, by the end of the year, we're still going to have the, the issue of education and understanding of blockchain and, and the difference between that and, and cryptocurrencies. But there will be a pretty major shift, I think, and I would separate um, that shift between two different categories, and one being the consumer category, and how do they view blockchain, and how do they view cryptocurrencies versus corporates and versus institutions that use blockchain 
as an application within their businesses. And I think, similar to some of the ideas that were shared on the panel just now, we are going to get to the point where, similar to the internet, you know, there used to be a time when everyone talked about it and said, wow, you know, I, I've got to get my business on the internet. A whole lot of talk, not a whole lot of action, because people didn't really under, understand what did that actually mean. They just said, you know, if I, if I talk about the internet and maybe put .com at the end of my name, everyone is going to think I'm smart and everyone's going to think the company's going to do really well. That's sort of the phase we are in right now when it comes to blockchain. A lot of companies are, are trying to get into that space and say, yeah, we're, we're doing blockchain but not necessarily doing it. But by the end of the year, I think companies will actually start doing it. And it's going to be uh, more of an afterthought as to whether companies are actually using blockchain because it is going to be so pervasive and it makes so much sense for uh, new, you know, most if not all companies to implement blockchain in some way, shape or form in their business. So it's, it's not really gonna be a big deal. You know, everyone's gonna be using blockchain. By everyone, I mean these corporates. When it comes to retail individuals, it's going to be more of the same, with, with one key difference, and it's tied into that the, the comment I just made, which is you know companies that understand blockchain and start using it are going to use it to great success. And for a lot of these cryptocurrencies that have pitched a vision, and most of these companies have done just that so far, uh, ours included. You know I readily admit, for those that can execute and actually deliver on that pitch, they're going to succeed. And for those that have not, by the end of the year, they're going to fail, and there's going to be a shakeout. Of the 1,500 cryptocurrencies that we see now, nowadays, most of those are are going to disappear. You know, they may still kind of be, you know, around there, lingering around, uh, you know, very very low um, price points from a fiat basis, but all the debt. And for those that actually can deliver on their promise and show that they actually are using blockchain, using cryptocurrency to build a new type of ecosystem, a new type of business model, they're going to do great. And I think those are the ones that are going to work uh, in a similar fashion to existing corporates, existing incumbents in being able to successfully use blockchain and create value as a result of doing so. So um, actually two days ago, in the other event I joined, there was one audience who actually asked me, seeing all those regulations, do you think is blockchain dying or is cryptocurrency dying? So my answer is, first, I didn't think blockchain would die because everybody can see it's changing our life in all the ways it changes. So um, also for Bitcoin, which is always tied up with blockchain technology. I didn't think Bitcoin will die, even though people are discussing that Bitcoin is not as good as some newer coins like Ethereum, Litecoin, or even some newer coins. So um, I think it's been almost 10 years since we first heard the, the name Bitcoin. And it actually changed the way people think and it changed the way how startup companies raise this capital. Um, as a compliance officer, since our exchanges always receive all kinds of listing applications, and I have seen so many crazy ideas. They are so crazy that I cannot even, I didn't know how to accept them. But the thing is, I think this is just one thing, one good thing about ICO and cryptocurrency is that you can always find some other people who are just as crazy as you. Just imagine someday when your dream will come true, when those crazy ideas will come to reality. So I don't think ICO will die. I think ICO will become a new form of fundraising for startup companies as long as our regulators will keep an open mind and lower the threshold for the companies to do fundraising and as long as our developers and insurers and startup entrepreneurs are trying to welcome the regulations. And I yeah, I think that's actually the future of our life. Nothing will die. When thing ever happened it never dies. It will exist in your history forever and change our life. So now we, we will take questions from the audience. If you have any questions for, uh, for our panelists, please raise your hand. Okay, so this, oh. yeah, this, 
Yeah, uh, I actually have a couple of questions. One is that uh, probably the whole panel sort of like in this Neo ecosystem. So can you guys clarify like exactly how you guys are related to Neo? Are you like a smart contract on it? Or, or what else and why you chose Neo rather than another one like Ethereum? Um, my second question is, seems like the whole panel is also very like bicultural, like, you know, China and US. Can you say a little bit about like, you know, do you think the two communities would converge or diverge or how is this going to evolve over the next few years? Okay, uh, first of all, we have four projects from um, NEO, which is Epiphany, uh, DeepBrain, and uh, PBS and Repos. So we can only ask questions to these four panelists. And also, yeah, we can start uh, um, from uh, this, but just mind the time, we have only one minute for each panelist. Yeah, so DeepBrain Chain, uh, as I mentioned, is an AI computing platform driven by blockchain. We use NEO as our uh, platform. We run the smart contract on, within, on top of it. Yes. So uh, we are partnering with a new project that the, the original uh, team of, actually the, uh, yeah, so, uh, so there's another project called Ontology, which is actually launched by the same founding team of NEO. But we're using the ID system of that infrastructure in the PTS project. But PTS uh, for the public chain part is not based on the NEO chain, which is the, the uh, previous, uh, no, the first project of the foundation. So Red Pulse is the first ICO on the NEO platform, and I, I think it was actually a couple of months before the second one came on board, and really honored to actually be on uh, the first to go. Now the reason why we chose NEO, for us there's several, and the first being from a market standpoint, the team all originated from China, and you know, now that the infrastructure and technology has, of course, gone beyond China's borders, you can't consider it necessarily a Chinese platform any longer. You know, there's oftentimes a misconception there. It's a global platform, and they have key developers that spans the globe, especially from City of Zion, who we very also, very closely also work, uh, continue to work with at Red Pulse, and so it's that alignment in terms of you know where they originated from and, and where a lot of the team sits where my team sits across Hong Kong and Shanghai, it was just very easy to connect with them and be able to meet with them in person. The second key reason is their technology, which is much more mature compared to other platforms. And specifically, you're asking about Neo versus Ethereum. Ethereum's been around, they're the pioneer when it comes to smart contracts. Vitalik did an amazing job creating that innovation there. But there's a couple of downsides of Ethereum. TPS, transactions per second. Uh, scalability, you know, um, and Bitcoin for that matter, in terms of efficiency. And I think there were a lot of great lessons learned by the NEO team in being able to incorporate those aspects that did make sense and continue to make sense as part of their blockchain infrastructure, <laughs> but to address some of the challenges that have, that have arisen in those previous blockchain infrastructures, and they've done so quite quite effectively. So that's probably the biggest reason that we decided to go with Neo. And and third, you know, they're just great guys to work with. You know, I, just, I like the guys. You know, I see Johnson back in the room there. He's actually the first Neo guy that I met uh, way back when. And um, you know, it was great to uh, great to meet them, and they were all very very um, helpful and, and super nice guys. So was really excited to work with them. Yeah, I, I think you, you guys should look into ontology, uh, which is also a part of the NEO ecosystem, uh, but it's not NEO, the chain. Uh, but this new project is super exciting, and if, especially if you're doing ID related things and data exchange, etc. Yeah. I think NEO is going to be very happy that we are branding them and bragging about them. Um, Epiphany is also built on NEO. We uh, made this decision based on three reasons. First, 
um, Neil is running a really good community, and also the reputation of Neil is really high, no matter it's in Asia or America or any other region. And the second reason is because right now there are uh, more than 50 applications built on Neil, and all those projects are very good. And uh, as an exchange, we wanted to list many, uh, as many good projects as we want, uh, as we hope to. And the third reason is because actually we are talking with the uh, points uh, because we have this new feature called the brokerage. We wanted to have some uh, benefits from Neo because this uh, digital identity feature that probably will benefit us. So these are the three reasons that we chose Neo. And for the second question about this mixed culture and about the blockchain industry in America and Asia, so uh, I think uh, Robert is the expert. <laughs> yeah, we're a global company. Uh, our headquarters are in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and we're opening up uh, U.S. headquarters imminently um, and building up our team. Again, we're kind of a startup. Uh, Bruno Wu, who's the chairman of the company, uh, CEO, I'm the president. Uh, the, uh, Bruno's Americanized, uh, but we have a lot of business in China. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of business in America. Uh, we're going to be focusing on 20 to 30 different uh, territories uh, to essentially drop our stack uh, of software off. Uh, we don't want to get into the um, local regulations and, and all those things. What we want to do is to build up a global partner trading network um, and essentially do rev share, uh, no barriers to uh, entry, uh, all success-based and enable uh, the various exchanges and banks around the, around the globe to access new revenue streams that they currently don't tap into through the technology that we're going to provide. So that's the business model. We're going to be global. But right now, a lot of, we get a lot of business in China, Singapore, uh, but America is coming very, very fast. And I think I alluded to the uh, REITs. The untradable weeds, the illiquid weeds, is a very, very large market that we want to tap into as a, uh, one of our first priorities, and that will be a global. As soon as we get up and running in America, then it just goes out uh, everywhere. Okay. So, uh, due to the Due to the time, we won't be able to take another question, but we can move our discussion outside of this room. And uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, please ask, uh, but uh, in a private way. Thank you very much for coming here and joining our event. And, uh, I hope that in the future we can have another event like this again. Thank you.